Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 109, End of Summer AMA. I'm Sean, who hates hot weather, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. You can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern, Toronto, New York time at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, it is the end of September here in Ontario, and that means leaving the summer heat behind. Shorter days, which may lead to more indoor gaming days, and spooky season fast approaching. In observation of that tradition, we are going to review a couple of games based on this change in season. Up first, I'll be taking a look back at Azul Summer Pavilion, followed by a look at something new with Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. As it is the end of the month, in addition to these reviews, we'll be spending the Ask the Bellhop segment of the show answering questions from our lobby live. Or if our lobby is quiet tonight, which I hope it's not, tackling some questions that were a little too short to feature in a full podcast episode. We will, of course, be finishing off with the Bellhop's Tabletop Week in Review, where I've got some disappointing thoughts on CO2 Second Chance and of Watergate. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interaction with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com, that's M-O-E, or sean at tabletopbellhop.com, that's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the other day we reshared our list of games that require little or no physical contact and got a bit of feedback on that. Jennifer Burke commented, I would add the Catan Universe app. Patron of the show, Jeff Seuss, plus one to Consulting Detective and For the Queen for sure. I'd add Disney's Villainous. You play your own cards to your own board and other players relatively infrequently play your own enemy cards to your board. So they could just tell you when to draw and when to place. I'd also add that we know enough these days that touching the same components as other players is believed to be safe as long as we wash or disinfect our hands afterwards. The primary safety measure is to play games that let you stay six feet away from each other, masked or outdoors. So even if you have to share a board or some cards, you can sit far, uh, if you can sit far away, you can play. Well, thanks for the comments, Jennifer and Jeff. Uh, Catan Universe is a great way to play games online, uh, the Catan series of games. But uh, well, during that post, we didn't really talk about online games, but there are a ton of places out there to play all kinds of tabletop games online. Like we've got an entire episode talking about the best places to do this, uh, three of the hottest. Now, as for Jeff's comment, the problem I have with sharing components with people right now is that people are really bad at not touching their face. If anyone was here live, you'll realize I actually just scratched totally unintentionally before saying that. Um, unless you wash your hands after every turn or after every hands of cards, as someone who's personally high risk, who's also living with someone who's even higher risk, I still think it's not worth taking that chance. Now, I have played enough RPGs over the years, right? And many other people out there know that even if there's a 99% chance of success, there's still that chance of rolling a one. Well, next, we have a couple of comments on our topics of things game designers can do to make their games easier to learn and play. Cindy Robertson writes, My problem is with games that use apps is quite often the app seems like the only way to play the game. I'm not a fan of that because there will come a time when the app is not available at some point. Now I have a game that I may enjoy that I can't play anymore. I've had apps, not game apps, just no longer be supported by my new device. Mm -hmm. I don't want that to happen to a game. And Jeb Boyt writes, I love the depiction of the six zones of play, but it doesn't include a zone for rolling dice. All right, thanks for the comments there, Jeb and Cindy. Um, starting off with Cindy's comment, I'm a, I'm a mixed mind when it comes to board game apps. Like, I really don't know. I, I'm, I'm on the fence in a way because one of the things is 
this today's gaming society, the way people play games, and the way they, they they approach games nowadays, is you don't really have a lot of evergreen games. There aren't games that you've been playing ten years after they come out or five years. Most of the games we have, we play a handful of times and then move on to something else. And I can't think of many app-based games that I honestly think I'll be playing in five or 10 years or once supports pulled, especially when you think of the games from the big companies. Now, where it is a concern are the small indie publishers, right? The little independent game that doesn't do that well and the company ends up folding or whatever and they can't maintain the app. Whereas a Fantasy Flight game, you know it's going to be supported for a year or two, probably at least five or 10, whereas something from Joe Bo publisher may not be able to keep it up. So I don't know. I, I do worry that maybe uh, the, the app will die first. And then there's the fact for most apps, you can find APK files. So even if the game is pulled from the app store, you can still find the file. But of course that doesn't work with what Cindy's talking about where all of a sudden your app just won't play or your, your device will no longer play older apps. So I don't know. I, like it's, I, I get it. It's valid. I totally agree with it. But so far I haven't stopped buying app based games for that point because I know I'm going to get distracted by something else in time. Now I know you have a stronger opinion on apps and are a little bit more firm in your beliefs. What do you think, Sean? So I'm, I'm really on Cindy's side here. Uh, especially as someone who isn't generally interested in buying the one-and-done games. Seeing an app is going to make me hesitate to purchase if the app is required to play, as opposed to just a helper. Mm -hmm. um, as for apps stopping working, there are two main problems. While, sure, you can dig up an Android APK for most files, that still leaves out most Apple users, uh, oh. as well as, as Cindy mentioned, older uh, you know, newer devices not playing older apps that are unsupported. Mm -hmm. um, and with some of the machinations of the government these days, we may see phones further locked down to prevent even True. Android phones from sideloading apps. Now, secondly, the apps or even a website will generally require a backend server. And that's a cost that the company needs to support once because once it's gone, the app is just a shell and probably won't be able to do much. All fair points. Now, Jeb's comment. Jeb was asking about the zones of play. Well, the reason dice aren't listed as a zone is because they're a component, right? They're, they're something you use during the game. And the designer has to decide what zone they belong in, depending on what you do with the dice, right? So if you're going to have dice where, say, you're going to roll them and you're immediately going to use those dice on your turn, you're going to want to roll those in your tableau, right? Right in front of you, zone three. Whereas if it's dice you're rolling and any player can take them or they can be drafted or they set, say, a resource price, you're going to throw those on the board, right? Zone four. Or dice that are only used once, like maybe you roll at the start of the turn and it determines the, the cost of stuff at the bank, but all you need is to reference it. Maybe you put that in the sidebar, right? It doesn't need to be on the board. It can be off to the side and people just look over and go, yeah, that's right. The price of gold is five this turn. Or there's even games where you roll dice at the start of the game to determine, say, what starting resource everyone gets. And then those dice can go into zone six, right into the box. Yeah, absolutely. And if your dice stay in zone one, you should probably stop carrying a dice tray everywhere you go. Now, we received a string of comments on our Gloomhaven FAQ video from Kindlesmith80, which I think are all summed up well by this one final comment. This video has made me go through the world book more, which is nice to familiarize myself with the game. I do love these. I did learn some things, well, relearn. It fixed up some of my misconceptions from reading the different character builds. Thanks for, thank you for the vid. I got to say, it was an interesting thread to see. I can't remember where I was, but I was texting Sean at the time because this person was writing comments as they were watching the video, which is about four hours long. And every few, I don't know, like 30, 40 minutes, my phone would go off and I'd be like, oh, I got another comment. And they'd broken it up into other comments. And by the end, I think they listed eight different comments on YouTube, all of which were like six to 18 paragraphs long. It was pretty crazy. Um, the cool part was by the end of it, it was it was neat to see them change their view. Like it started off as a, oh, well, I'm not wrong. I'm doing it right. And you guys don't know what you're talking about to, oh, wait, no. Okay, I checked that and I checked that, which was cool because really this was the entire point of the video was to get people 
to reevaluate their interpretation of the rules. And I got to admit, I, like at first it was a, a little contra uh, not controversial, confrontational, I would say in tone, but I appreciate it. I, I appreciate that the, they went to the detail of breaking down the commentary with um, like, like timestamps, the whole bit. Right. So some of it had to look up. It was like, no, you're wrong. It only moves three. And I'm like, what? I don't know what you're talking about, but it was, it was definitely interesting to see. And I think we won them over by the end. So that's always great. Well, finally, Glenn Flair, uh, Faraday had a quick comment on our unlabeled review from last week. Mm -hmm. Looks like the perfect compliment to charcuterie. I can't argue with that one. Um, seeing as anyone who follows me online who looks at my food port and post should be well aware because you'll often see charcuterie in the background of my pictures of unlabeled. So we even did it again this past weekend. So we had some charcuterie craft beer and cardboard. Um, the beer came from the Wellington Brewery in Guelph where we kind of took part in a virtual uh, beer festival. But more about that when we get to the weekend review. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thank you to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. Are you new to our content? Do you wonder why all Moe's pictures have a bell in them somewhere? Well, we won't tell you. It's like a game. <laughs> Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. That's our weekly newsletter that I write every week and send out usually on Wednesdays. And uh, it features everything we released in the week previous and man we we got to slow down it's this newsletter's getting too long we put out too much stuff over too many days and it's becoming way too much work but no there's a lot of stuff there check it out uh we've got youtube videos almost every week you got links to all those you got links to all my reviews any ask the bellhops gaming advice articles updates to our master list all of that goes in the newsletter it is the best spot to make sure you don't miss out on anything you can go uh, sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and subscribing right there in the sidebar or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. Mm -hmm. Our Hogwarts battle giveaway has ended, or at least it will be for you people in the listening. Tune in next <laughs> week to learn who won. <laughs> All right. I, I guess these are announcements. This is something I just wanted to talk about a bit. So the last few weeks, we've been doing a number of things to improve the quality of our video content in particular. We've done a little bit for the other stuff, like rearranging some new cables for the audio, but mainly the video. Um, and I just wanted to call this out for anyone who may have missed it, especially if you've given up on our earlier content because of the quality. Maybe we've moved it up a step to make it more uh, palatable. And not only did the Bellhop get new gear, I got Windsor Pizza. Yeah, I can't complain about that. I'll, I'd, I'd trade in some of the gear for Windsor Pizza <laughs> sometime soon. So to start, the last five unboxing videos I recorded, we used a new camera for recording, for recording me in the box. And that was a camcorder. That one, okay. Uh, that particular camera has a very narrow field of vision. So that part was, was it was okay. I, I would have liked... I kind of actually prefer our old camera for that. But the big thing that let me do is free up this camera, which is our webcam, to do a point down shot to do a close up camera with a blue screen. And that I thought was really cool because then I could get close ups of the components as I was unboxing. You can see that close up effect on our Scooby Doo unboxing that is already live and our Watergate unboxing going live on Monday. Yeah, the Scooby-Doo turned out really good, except for when you had characters with blue backgrounds. But if I didn't do that, I'd have problems with the characters with the green backgrounds. So there, there are still some improvements to be made there. Um, I need to get an actual chroma key blue, I think might help a bit there. And overall, like I said, I got to figure something out for that other camera, which might involve recording somewhere else. But that's well, and the other option, I mean, until until moving movement happens, it may be that you swap. So maybe that camcorder becomes the top-down camera. Yeah, I might be able to mount it that way. With the narrower field of vision, it might be fine. Yeah, yeah, that might be another thing. Anyway, the second thing we did was use that same new camera, the camcorder. Technically, it's not new. It's just we found a way to use it to um, get a recording of Deanna and I when we played our actual plays, which right now has been Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Now, the laptop itself we're using, unfortunately, can't handle two camera imports. Well, it can, but it needs a USB 3.0 ports. But whatever, the, the laptop can't handle it. That's what matters. But what we were able to do is set up the tripod like way across the room, because again, that narrow field of vision, to record us as we played. So what we were able to do is, well, you didn't get to see that live. So I do apologize for those of you watching live, you didn't get to see that angle. But Sean was able to take that video and integrate it into the YouTube version of our actual place. So the first actual play featuring this effect goes live tomorrow, October 1st. The real benefit of this is that it makes the play feel more alive 
as with a thinky game like Gloomhaven, there's often some card shuffling and thinking and, 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 and staring at your hand that just doesn't show up on the map view. And yeah. it wasn't able to be cut because there was often discussion about what cards were going to be played going on. But video wise, it was really boring content. Yeah. It was it was stare at the screen with yeah. no shadows, nothing moving. It looks like it's frozen, but here D and I talk. So yeah. another thing we did do to improve that is we have moved our mic position. So you should be able to hear Deanna now when we play, which was an issue with some of our first uh, Jaws Alliance. So the next big thing, the next big improvement is I have a local techie, um, someone I went to the University of Windsor with in computer science, long-term friend, um, Prowler, for those of you from the Windsor BBS days, uh, is working on making me a new PC. Um, this is going to be one that can handle multiple camera inputs and multiple USB 3.0 parts. And once that's in, we are going to consider shifting all of our video recording downstairs. So once we do that, we should be able to have both cameras actually on the um, on the stream and we should be able to possibly even get three or four different angles in there and maybe Sean can even do some cuts once he starts doing the editing and all that fun stuff. So we are really looking forward to those improvements. All of these improvements have been funded in part due to our awesome Patreon patrons. Thank you very much for your support. Yes, thank you all. All right, that's enough pre-show. Let's get into the ask. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere. It's tabletop bellhop one word. Now the best way is for questions to go through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. It is the last Wednesday of the month. And that means it's time for another tabletop bellhop AMA, where we will be answering the questions from the fine folk in our chat room, the lobby or in discord or anything that's come in over Twitter in the uh, preceding weeks. Yep. Now, thank you everyone who's taken the time to join us live tonight. Uh, these Q&A periods are always a blast, and the more people we get in the lobby, the better it gets. We try to do these uh, at least every other month. We're, we're not sure if we're going to keep doing them every month. Last month, we did skip. Um, this is the end of September, right? So summer's out. We're done with summer, and we have officially moved into fall. So what I thought would be interesting, and just to, just to give people like a a narrower focus than usual because usually we open this up and we're like and everyone just kind of goes oh i don't know what to say so i was wondering if anyone had any questions about transitions or or switching from one thing to another right now no again this is an ama feel free to ask absolutely anything as as you wish but it would be cool to stick to the topic plus it's just some inspiration to go on if it's just something to get the discussion going all right well we don't have anything in the chat room just yet so to get things growing, we have a question about transition additions in D&D. &D. All right. Christoph Vesna writes, I'd like to submit a question, if I may. In your opinion, would it be more beneficial for an RP group to keep rolling with D&D &D 5 Ed or to drop back to 3.5 or Pathfinder? We have a few players who love trying to make all these oddball character class combinations, and I think it may be easier in 3.5 or Pathfinder. However, I'm not sure if it would be worth it in the long run. Sorry. That shouldn't have been on. My bad. All right. Sorry. Uh, so we have someone who has a group that likes customization in their RPG games, specifically in D&D. &D, and they are wondering about switching back to an earlier edition of D&D because D&D 5e doesn't have as much customization. Now, I will say D&D 5e does have a ton of customization. It's not like the options aren't there, but it, they did remove a lot of the, the min-maxing, the, the they're trying to combo your character class with the perfect stats, with the perfect feats, with the perfect skills, with the perfect prestige class, and the perfect magic items, and all those things, right? To try to get the most optimal build to do the thing your character does best better and in 99.9% .9 of the cases that was win combats because that's what you do a lot in D&D now this isn't a judgment on D&D or that style of play it's a perfectly valid way to play that I have enjoyed greatly myself I honestly think if you have a group that is all about that maximization that yes dropping back to one of the earlier editions of the game is is a very valid thing to do 
in particular, 3.5 D&D or Pathfinder. And to me, those games are almost identical. I actually like the flavor of Pathfinder more. I love the whole Pathfinder society element. And the modules are amazing. Like, that's what Paizo got famous for, was writing good D&D modules. They, they owned Dragon Magazine for years, right? And then when D&D went to fourth edition, they went, well, we kind of like the way we were playing before and wrote Pathfinder. That's basically what it is, right? So Pathfinder... I almost recommend more than 3.5 for a slightly better focus. I like the background better. And if all you want to do is be really good at things, their mission-based system, the whole Pathfinder Society thing, very much drives you to that point. 3.5 still is valid. Personally, I would recommend fourth, but I obviously the fact that um, Christoph didn't bring it up, that's probably not an option for their group. But man, fourth, especially organized play, was very much about optimizing your characters to the fact that we had problems at local gaming events where people would get mad at other people for showing up with sub-optimized characters, which was a problem with organized play at that time. Because organized play at that time, you only got the reward if you passed the mission. And if you weren't there with an optimal build, you were ruining someone else's play experience. And now they couldn't go to Gen Con to get the other shiny thing to bring home. So there's all kinds of things there. But yeah, I, I don't, there's no reason you need to be playing the current edition of D&D. Like, yes, it's the most popular right now. It's the most popular of all time, supposedly, according to Wizards of Coast and their numbers, which I fully believe them on, actually. Um, you got shows like Critical Role. You got tons of people. Like, just looking at my Twitter feed, the number of people talking D&D constantly is shocking. Like, a, a crazy amount of people talking D&D all the time. But there's no reason. The old books still work. Like, there's nothing that ruined it. And especially for 3.5 D&D and Pathfinder, with the OGL, there is so much content out there. You're not going to run out. There is a lifetime's worth of adventures and modules. And 90% of that, you got splat books. Like, even if your characters get bored of um, the, the core rule books, you've got all of the, the different books for more optimization. Now, another option, which I personally have not investigated at all, except to share some deals on it, is there's now a Pathfinder 2nd Edition. I don't know. I, I know nothing about it, except I know that Pathfinder kind of got too big, that there was just too much stuff out there, and there were too many options, and there was people were finding broken combos, and they kind of brought it all back in and brought it back down to one book again. And then, of course, now they're putting on splat books, and it's probably going to do the same thing. But I haven't played second edition pathfinder and i'm sorry to say i don't see anyone excited about second edition pathfinder now maybe it's just that not the people i follow but i don't see a lot of hype about that at all i haven't seen any opinions on if it's better or worse than the old edition all i know is it came out so that might be another valid one but don't feel you need to play fifth ed D&D because it's the latest edition that's a it's a silly thought process you don't have to play the latest edition of a game and right. I just went on forever and didn't let Sean talk at all. So, well, you know what? I mean, I, honestly, I I really have no nothing to say on this one. I haven't played D anD D since second or two point five. Yeah, uh, skills and powers. Uh, my actual, my, I actually had a question to sort of back off that. Um, in in fifth ed, do they have multi class or split class characters still? Like, is that still part of D anD D? I do not think so. I know feats are optional now. So the whole, when you level up, you get a feat that gives you a special ability that makes you different from everyone else. Those are now optional rules. I have no idea if there's multi-classing or um, the old, what were the two? Multi, there were two different things. So yeah, you were multi-classing or multi-classing. And, yeah. and split class. And split class. So Evil John in the chat, thank you, is saying you can multi-class. I'm not the one to ask about 5th edition. I have yeah. never read the book. True, D's I, actually played more 5th edition than you, I think. Yeah, I, I'm like... Maybe and please, maybe that's my bias. Why I'm saying don't bother playing fifth. I haven't. I've played fifth edition D and D once at a con. I own the player's handbook downstairs because I bought it when it came out because I was like, oh, new edition of D and D. And I own a sealed copy of the the starter set, but it's still in shrink. Like I, I just never, I never went that way. I, we were we were at the time when it came out. We were having fun playing Warhammer Third Edition, and then we were supposed to move on to Star Wars: Edge of the Empire. So, right. Yeah, so I, I, I know enough. The only reason I know what I do know is I follow a lot of podcasts that talk about D&D 5th. But multi-classing never came up, so. Right. Uh, and I, you know what? A quick, uh, at least, Twitter search for Pathfinder 2E shows a lot of people talking about it. So it's no. there. I think it's just not there in, in our 
in our groups. Yeah, it's just it's not a, it's not in our I wouldn't say echo chamber. It's not like I tried to tune out the Pathfinder people, but yep. they're just it's not what we normally talk about. So it makes sense that we wouldn't have that circle of friends. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Well, we got a great question from Brian in the chat room, a longtime okay. friend of the show. Your topic of transitions made me think of something. I was rereading the Bellhops review of Fox in the Forest duet. I know he commented that Anshi Games doesn't usually like co-op games. Now, she's played a ton of games of all kinds over the years, but my wife hasn't. And I was thinking I might play Fox in the Forest duet with her. Is there anything that you find is helpful to tell people who are used to the mindset of competitive games to get them to enjoy co-op games? I'm tempted to have Deanna come over here and answer <laughs> this for that matter, which she's welcome to if she wants. I can slide over a bit. She won't hear this for a little bit, so we'll give her a couple seconds. Um, <laughs> so I guess not. Um, she is welcome to, to answer that. Um, I'm trying to think what I would tell people. For one, point out that it's still about winning. It's still a game. Um, just because we're playing cooperative doesn't mean it's now an activity or it's just for fun. Because usually what people like in a competition is they like to win. They like to beat something. The difference is that instead of trying to beat me, you're trying to beat the game and get that across that it's it's us versus them, but the them is the mechanics or the system or the cards or the app in that case, because many, many cooperative games are now app based. Yep. Um, the other ones are um, trying to think to make cooperative. So I think one of the first things you want to look at is how competitive that person is. So yeah. if, if they're a table flipper in Monopoly, um, it might take a little more effort to bring them into that co-op thing because they're, you know, they're used to that, that competitive nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and the relationship between you and that other person is part of it as well. Um, someone you're more antagonistic with um, in, in certain forms, uh, not to say that you're necessarily antagonistic with your wife, of course, but uh, you know, if you, depending on the relationship and, and how you work together, um, whether or not there's more complementing or integrating and, and how that relationship works can also play into how you're going to play a co-op game um, and, and, and how you might approach bringing people into that co-op game. Uh, if, if they are a heavily competitive player, you focus on that competitive nature, but you've got someone helping you compete, right? So you're both competing. Mm -hmm. You're still yes. competing. You are looking to beat. You're That's looking what... to win, but... You've got someone helping you find the extra, you know, find that extra oomph to win. Um, whereas if, you know, if, if they are more, I don't even, don't know the best words to say it, but more cooperative, then you can focus on that playing together aspect mm. and look at the, the cooperation and the, the mm. working together and bettering each other through your own individual play right. versus the you know, competitive against something else. Another way to think of it too is instead of thinking of it as a cooperative game, think of it as a team game. You are a team who is working together to, again, beat the thing, which is the game, beat the other side. But in this case, the other side is an AI or, or thing. But like trying to say, hey, we're a team, we're working together. Um, it's, we're each going to be able to do our own thing. So that's another one, depending on who you're playing with and what they want. So if you're playing a cooperative game with someone who's new, who's new to games, you're going to, your selling point's going to be, you know what, we can play with open cards and I can help you play and you don't have to worry about knowing all the rules. We can work together to learn them together and you're playing up that I will support you. I will help you. Whereas if you're playing with someone who plays games and who's competitive, you can start saying, no, we will work together to beat this being another angle of it. And then another one is you want to, especially with a competitive player, point out that you're going to still be able to do your own thing. Despite the fact we're playing this together, we're still each going to make our own decisions. You're going to get to control your character. I'm going to control my character, whatever it is. Or you're going to get to do this part of the game. Like uh, we're going to be talking about a cooperative game later tonight where you could sit there and sit down and say, you're going to play this character. You're going to play this character. You're going to play this character. And that's what you might want to do with a competitive player. Whereas if you're playing with a newer player, you can say, no, you know what? We're all just going to play everyone. Everyone can make decisions and together we'll decide what to do as a group. Whereas I think with the competitive player, you want to kind of segregate, right? You're going to do your thing. I'm going to do my thing. The other thing you might want to look at is um, I'm trying to think of the silly term I've heard for this. Uh, I can't remember it, but it's, it's, it's semi-co-op games. 
So games you can play together, but there's still a winner. So uh, who's going to play better, right? Who's going to do the most? So an, an example of that is CO2, which we're going to talk a bit about later tonight. The competitive mode on that has been changed to a competitive co-op because if you don't work together, you're going to lose. Whereas if you work together, one of you is still going to do better. Another example of that are the Marvel Legendary games. All of the Upper Deck Legendary, it doesn't have to be Marvel actually, all of the Upper Deck Legendary games are actually competitive games. Like, yes, you're working together to defeat the villains, but at the end of the game, you're going to go through your deck and take out all the ones you defeated and add up the points. And whoever has the most points wins. So that might be another way to approach it. Now, that's not going to help with Fox in the Forest duet, for example, or say Codenames duet, but it is going to matter if you're just trying to I, I wean a person off the comp competitive games into co-op. That might be a good gateway, a way to, to yes, we're, we're doing this together, but one of us wins. And perhaps you could take that and add an element of that to a pure co-op. So if there's some way to change it so that I'm trying to think of Fox of the Forest duet off the top of my head, you could grab the, whoever collected the gems could collect them, like put them in front of them. And then the winner of the two of you, even though you won the game, is throughout the game who collected the most gems. Or I'm trying to think of other quiet, a pandemic. No, you can't collect the cubes you've cured because if you collect the cubes you cured, there's a thing about running out of cubes. Maybe you can mark down how many things you've done, right? You could add a scoring system to it, and that might interest a competitive player more. Interesting. All right. Um... We got we have some great people in the chat room, but they're being quiet. <laughs> yes, they are. It's an AMA. Come on, people. Thank you for the question, Brian. All right. Well, we got a question from Jeff, who's not with us in the chat room, but he's with us here in spirit. Yeah. So what inspired you to make the move from blogging to podcasting? All right. So that Sean's got some history in that one. Sean, it, Sean pushed me. That was pretty much it. Um, goes back to breakout con. The first one we ever attended at dinner we had together and Sean has been pushing me to try to podcast for many years now. And he kind of got us to the, uh, got us to that point where we, we had seriously started talking about it. So I don't know if you want to lead up to that and then I can go on to the next thing that happened that made it more of a reality. Yeah, well, I mean, Mo had been had been had been blogging for for ages, so I think yeah. that's uh, you know that that goes the history of that goes back a very when did when did WGR start? Two thousand and two. Two thousand. So it's two thousand and two. The blog and the the online forums. Yeah, at and, the time and, it was a forum. It was yeah. a, a pro boards forum. I launched in two thousand and two. So we started with that, and you know, around that same time, more or less, uh, podcasting started to break out in some. Some circles, uh, you know, I, it wasn't really until the iPod made it huge that it became a really big thing uh, and the iPhone dri driving on from that. But it was, you know, it was there in the background and I, I got involved listening to a lot of the early podcasts um, and it just seemed like a great way to get information across to people uh, as well as just being in a many cases, two people who knew each other having really good conversations about a topic. Uh, and that was my first concept was mm -hmm. really the whole idea of me sitting down with Mo and me being the common man who's not the hobby board game guy and having a chat with this person who knows more about hobby board gaming than I could ever know to share and using that as a dialogue to inform the public about stuff. Uh, we didn't really have, there was really wasn't any more concept than that. Basically I wanted to chat more with my buddy who lived four hours away <laughs> And it was a topic that we had the ability to, uh, to talk about, you know, it was, it was, it was something that we could inform other people about, mm -hmm. uh, fast forward to, you know, 2018 breakout con, uh, I managed to get Mo and D together at a table and discuss this with them. And I don't think we'd ever really talked about it with D there before. No. Um, and her knowledge and her, her blogging experience, uh, and her SEO experience was something that she was able to sort of reframe into what we were talking about and understand and, and understand from a business point of view that it was technically possible to make that into something. Yeah. 
Yeah, Deanna really pushed it. She thought it would be a way to promote the blog. I had come up with the name. That was another big part of it. I don't even know when I came up with the name, if it was in the shower or whatever. And I wanted to do something with it. I wanted to rebrand the Windsor Gaming Resource. So I used to blog. It's still there. If you go to WindsorGamingResource.com, I think it's still there. WGR.com. It's a Windsor Gaming, WindsorGaming.com it might be at. It's the blog's still up. I didn't take it down. It's still got all the old content on it, though I did notice a bunch of the uh, the images are dead because they were linking to things that are no longer there. And I used to use Photo Bucket for all my image storage and the Photo Bucket, as far as I know, was long gone. I know it switched to a paid model. Right. So that's kind of gone. So I was under Windsor Gaming and I wanted to separate myself from the Windsor Gaming crowd. Nothing against the Windsor Gaming crowd. But I wanted to, to be more global because I'm like, Ed, who's going to go to the Windsor Gaming Resource for a review on a Paranoia game? Like, who cares about Windsor, right? <laughs> so I wanted to separate that. I wanted the Windsor Gaming Resource to still be around, which it is on Facebook, and I'd still promote local events. But I wanted it separated from me talking about games and that. So I had come up with this idea of the tabletop bellhop where I and, and it was also inspired by the R RPG podcast Happy Jacks which is a Q&A show. Now, Happy Jacks is, we didn't go, we deviated from what Happy Jacks does. I kind of hoped it went that way and it didn't. I don't know if it's a bad thing. They have very long Q&As, like, like people write in short stories almost about their gaming things that happened in, in the RPG sphere. And then a circle of hosts talk about those experiences and what went wrong, what went right, what the people could do better. You handled it well or not. And it would have been cool to kind of go there. Like if I would sit there, you know, last Thursday I was sitting at a goblin con and at goblin con, I overheard this conversation and it made me feel uncomfortable. So I did this and here's what the person did. And I, you know, like big long. And then Sean and I talk about it. That was more what I thought we'd get, which is fine. We didn't that's perfectly cool we did get some longer form things but i kind of had the idea for this for the the question for it and we talked about it with sean and at the time i was a huge fan of the misdirected mark podcast still am actually i shouldn't say i'm not anymore but the hosts of that show were there so after the conversation with sean and deanna i decided to pitch them and say hey would you be interested in this? And at the time they're like, Oh, we don't have a board game show. And I'm like, but I want to be a board game show. I want to be a tabletop show. I want to do both. I'm like, well, we want a board game show. Cause we already have a bunch of RPG shows. I'm like, oh, I guess I could do board games, but I do want to be able to talk about RPGs. Cause at the time I was playing both. So I don't know. It, 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 and at the time they were going through some restructuring. So different people were becoming in charge. And the person I thought was in charge was like, I can't tell you because I now have to ask my partner. And I never heard anything back like weeks went by and I'm like, all right, I guess I'll follow up at some point. And that's when, when, I don't know, the, the sword dropped, the, 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 the guillotine dropped or whatever. And all of a sudden I had been working in the automotive industry for 22 years. I was suddenly told I was out of work. So that all of a sudden I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> Time for a life change. Um, I got to admit, I pretty much hated working in the auto industry. That's why I think I have as much gray hair as I do now. It was a stressful thing. I didn't come home happy very often. So we took that happening as an opportunity to try this out. So that was, that was the whole thing. So we were going to sit there and give this a shot. Where We're going to, I got a hold of Sean and said, all right, we're going to go. We're going to do it. <laughs> I never heard back from Mr. Rack and Mark. So I'm like, well, sorry, Sean. Do you not have any idea how to run a podcast? Do you have any idea how to host it? Like I, I was kind of hoping we'd have an editor and, and the MMP people would be taking care of this part. And just you and I had talk, talk on mics, but Hey, can you, can you figure this out? And I think there was a lot of Google searching that happened. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've done production, but uh, this is a whole different level of production and uh, I'm still learning a lot of it as we go. And, uh, and, that was that was the jump we made. Uh, so Ryan has a question for us. Back into the gaming, what is an RPG system or setting that you've actually played that you did not enjoy? All right. So to tie it in with transitioning systems, I moved away from because I was no longer enjoying it. We're gonna try to stick to the theme. All right, so uh, Toon was probably the most disappointing RPG I ever played. I bought copies of it. Steve Jackson Games publishes this, and I don't know if there's anything wrong with the system. There are a lot of old Gronyards who tell me that it's great, and I just don't know way better, or I didn't understand it. 
which is possibly fair, but what I thought I was getting when I purchased Toon was an ability to play a role-playing game that felt like an episode of Animaniacs. I wanted to be able to have uh, Yakko, Wacko, and Dot with Yakko being the higher level character who could literally basically do anything and rewrite reality around them. And just like, the, like a high level tune, I was pictured him as that. Whereas his younger brother, Wacko wasn't as high level. Like he could do a couple of th silly things with sounds. He had some voices, but he didn't do as much stuff. And then you had Dot, which was the female character who was kind of in between the two. And then there were all the other little shows, right? The, the all the other little shows that were part of it that I thought you'd be able to recreate. And that is not it. Toon was much more Looney Tunes slapstick short scene of just stuff exploding and falling from the sky and crushing people and just just too over the top gonzo. I didn't feel like I was playing a cartoon. I just thought we were improvising. Like I, I, we could have sat together and written a cartoon together instead of playing a role playing game. It just did not work out for me at all. Now, I probably should have given Steve Jackson Games the benefit of the doubt and reread my book, but the fact it fell apart after only owning it for a month and it was in pieces, that it just ended up in the garbage because I didn't enjoy the game and physically it was badly produced and the glue let go and it fell apart. So two knocks against two every now and then. I don't play enough games nowadays. I think I should go, I don't know, find a, a PDF and read it and see if maybe I missed out on something. But that's just more the, the pressure of people who were fans of the show saying I should have enjoyed it more. Uh, for me, uh, I, I don't really have an RPG system that I haven't enjoyed. But I uh, and I think I'd actually been away at school when you started your Burning Sun game, and then I came back and jumped back into to playing uh, in the summer, perhaps. Or for for some reason, I wasn't involved in the the very beginning of the Burning of your Burning Sun campaign. Burnings. And uh, for some reason, that setting never, never worked for me. Um, I don't have anything named Burning Sun, so I'm trying to. Oh, that's right. Um, desert D &D. Desert D and D. Uh, Dark Sun. Dark, Dark Sun. Sun. Sorry. Okay. Yes, there we go. That's why I'm like I don't. I'm like don't Desert Burning, Burning Sun. Sun be, so. Dark Sun. So yeah. No, no, totally fair. Um, I, and and for some reason, that setting never wow felt right to me. Uh, and I, and I, I don't really know why, um, I, I suspect it's my own personal biases. And I mean, I want my, you know, swamps and forests for fantasy, <laughs> uh, I mean, may, may very well be it. Uh, and it's one of those things where the other one that I've, I've never had any interest in, and I've, I've listened to actual play podcasts about and still not enjoyed with Spelljammer. And again, it's one of those, and it's, it's the same reason why I've always stayed away from Shadowrun. I, mm. it's, it's one of those genre mixing things that feels off to me. Like I want to play pirates or, you know, magic, but not necessarily both. And I want to play my elves or my cyberpunk, but not both. Mm -hmm. um, keep your peanut butter out of my chocolate, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess. And, and, that is, and it's, I know it's my own biases. And because I mean, man, Spelljammer's got some huge fans out there. I mm -hmm. even saw you, you talking about uh, wishing you'd gotten into it recently. Yeah. I was going to say I'm the opposite. I yeah. used to be that way. I used to, I thought Spelljammer was the dumbest thing I'd ever seen. I saw the gif, a giant hippo guy and these stupid helmets people would put on. And then they did this thing where you could actually fly to the other D&D &D worlds where you could leave Toral space and fly to Kryn space and go to the Dragonlance world. And I just thought that was ridiculous. Now being much older, that sounds kind of awesome. I, I kind of want to start a game on one planet and like go to the Dragonlance. I want to put together a plot where you need like the, the, the MacGuffin from every planet. So you've got to like go get this spear that killed Kalak off Athlas, which is the Dark Sun world. And you got to get a dragon orb from, you know, uh, Tachesis on Dark Sun. And then you got to go to, I don't know any Forgotten Realms actual artifacts. I never read Forgotten Realms. You get a Forgotten Realms artifact and then you put them all together to kill the giant space dragon or something. I don't know. That sounds awesome to me now. And and like space rats and halflings swinging from the, the rafters of a spaceship. I don't know. But at the time I was with you 100%. Same thing. That's the same reason I didn't dive into Shadowrun then. Yeah. And I've now now read the the two most recent beginner boxes is because now i'm like oh that could be really cool i'll totally give it a try other ones that didn't work for me um dark sun i thought was amazing i loved dark sun but know what that was what i liked about dark sun is what i liked about warhammer i like playing the underdogs i like the the trying to survive for the day who cares about the war just can we make it till tomorrow which is the same thing you have in early level warhammer 
as you get. And it's the, it even goes back to Star Wars, right? It's the, the rebels with no chance against the Grand Imperium, except in Star Wars, they actually end up winning in the end, where I kind of prefer the, the grim, dark Warhammer, where eventually chaos is going to win, sorry. And I like that aspect of Dark Sun. It was D&D with that gritty, do you have enough water? That blade of grass over there might kill you. And, you know, the, the child over there is probably a psychic genius that can make your head explode. And there's nothing you can do about it. I, I enjoy that aspect of role-playing, or at least running games. So I think that was a big part of what made me like Dark Sun. It wasn't yeah. the desert. Yeah, no. Wasn't... And, that, and that's fair. And I think part of the, my problem may have actually been that if I want, if I'm going to get that underdog thing, I'd rather be playing Warhammer. Play Warhammer. <laughs> yeah. Which I probably at the time would have rather played Warhammer, but we had people who want to play D&D because that's, that's a thing that has happened throughout all my life. We talked about the popularity of D&D. It's D&D is very much the common denominator I found with role-playing groups. It's the one game where you get six different gamers who want six different things out of their game. You're probably never going to be able to pick a system, but all six of those players would probably say, sure, I'll play D&D because right. they know it. At, at least that's what, I, in my experience, that's what's happened. Now, what are the, the question is, other ones, I lost it because I scrolled down. There was RPGs we moved away from, settings we actually played that did not enjoy. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I We did play one game of GURPS. I wasn't a fan. I did not enjoy Amber the one time we were going to play it. Now, all we did was we went through the character generation system, but then, like, there was all this homework to do, and, like, that's that's a lifestyle game like it, it takes a level of investment that the dm really wanted everyone to get into and most of the players were kind of like oh, i'm gonna go home and draw tarot cards or write out novels or like come on i just want to show up and play so amber was one that did not work out i did think it was fascinating that it was a system that was written that was um diceless and that had some neat ideas but that was one i did not enjoy i, I think amber is one we would probably be more likely to drift you now where we have that yeah. more modern the more modern rpg um mindset and, are, and are, are more open to, to a lot of those different storytelling games as opposed to the dice mm. checkers that that was the thing it's the other thing too with amber is i think nowadays with the internet it'd be so much easier you'd have like a wiki where you could go <laughs> add your stuff and things like that i think that would be interesting um i i know there's others i'm trying to think of a couple others can do that do we have anything else oh we have something here yeah i was about to move <laughs> on and evil john jumps in so what's the view in a transition to digital from in-person rpgs that's something that we haven't especially really delved into much no. but uh you know it, it's it's happening a lot right now um whereas a lot of people are being forced into this new transition now luckily i think personally one of the greatest aspects of this is that we're all being forced to move digitally together, uh, whether it's an RPG, whether it's your work or anything else. So, you know, everyone now knows how to run a Zoom conference or a video conference of your choice. Uh, so there's a lot more comfortability of sitting around and staring at a screen full of your friends or family or, you know, coworkers or whatever. And so that, that, that force, you know that um momentum has helped all of us uh become a little more engaged and then with that we've had this explosion of new options to focus on the role playing part as well as the communication part which has already sort of been handled so i mean role 20 has been around for ages um and there are, mm -hmm. it has its ups and downs uh discord has really been sort of growing by leaps and bounds uh, in the role-playing community over the last couple of years. And then uh, we've now got other thing, other options showing up. We talked about one last week, uh, the, the Nomat... Um, the Owlbear? The Owlbear, yeah. Uh, the Owlbear at Nome or whatever it was called. It was something strange. Um, yeah, I forget offhand. That was a good one, too. Uh, and then uh, we've got, you know, the board game... Uh, Owlbear Arena. Rodeo. Owlbear.rodeo. There we go. Just, you know, a really quick and simple way to get things up and running when you've already got zoom or whatever uh running for your competition uh there are other ones like foundry ta a virtual tabletop where you can buy your own and run your own server in your own mm -hmm. for a bunch of different games uh or kickstarters had had some new ones i'm i'm waiting on hearing and i should be anytime today or tomorrow i think getting mm -hmm. my uh my my login for roll 
uh, R-O-L-E, which is one of the new ones coming up, which is a lot more focused on sort of a whiteboard and communication with a little bit of dice and not as heavy on the dungeons as something like mm-hmm. Roll20 is. Uh, so the, again, because we're all forced to move online, that has helped the role players who tend to be a little on the more technical, technically, technically savvy side or adaptable side to move with relative ease there. So view on transition to digital, I personally still prefer playing in person. I think I always will. I know a lot of people, though, who actually now prefer playing online that have gotten so used to it. The fact they can do it in the comfort of their own home. They don't have to go out. They don't have to meet with people. They don't have to worry about who's bringing the drinks or any of the the social graces of it. They don't have to worry about what they're wearing, whatever it is, whatever the case may be. They actually prefer playing online. The other thing is online has opened it up for people who don't have local groups, which I think is amazing. And that even pre-pandemic, post-pandemic has been an awesome thing. Like There are so many people. And then added to that is it has added a level of safety that was missing before. Before, you used to be stuck with who was local. And a lot of us put up with a lot of crap we probably should have never put up with just to be able to game. The, the gaming was worth enough to us that we would take risks and potentially hurt ourselves and others just to be able to play. Like, and I don't mean playing with sharp knives. I think people understand what I'm saying is, is there were, are some people you don't want to game with. And it used to be, you were stuck. You're like, I, either I play in this D and D campaign where the DM's a jerk and he's going to kill my family and he's going to make things happen to my character. I don't want to happen, but it's better than not playing at all. By being able to play online, you can leave those people behind. And if they're having their fun doing their thing, they can still stay in their basement doing their thing together or that player is eventually going to be left with no one to play with. And then when they get online, online, it's really simple to close a chat room or to block someone or to mute a channel or any of that, which is, I, I think, a really good thing. It's, it's something that people could not deal with in the past. And like I've met so many people that have been damaged from prior role-playing game groups, like players at public play events who come in and I can just tell, like they're, they're, there's a certain... I, a mannerism that players have that I'm like, wow, where the, the you played with DMs who did bad things. And that's sad. And it sucks. And it's awesome that you don't necessarily have to. Everyone does not, not everyone has to go through that. Anymore. Now, of course, there are still people who don't have the internet and everything. So that is one of the small problems with this is it is adding a level of classism to role playing that if you don't have the technology, you can't play online, which Thankfully, nowadays isn't a problem for most people. Like the technology is much more readily available, but there are still people out there who can't do a Zoom meeting, who don't have the technology, who don't have the smart devices to be able to play online. And I don't like that that is creating the divide. And I don't know if that'll ever be fixed. Yeah, unfortunately, I think one of the biggest uh, problems with the transition is the people who are already role playing can transition, but we are losing during this time of pandemic, Mm. the ability to get people into the system, right? You don't have that group of teenage friends coming home after school and opening up the red box or or whatever to sit around and explore this awesome thing that is role-playing because they can't. Um, And more than likely, they're going to sit down on, you know, FaceTime and watch a YouTube video together or something um, because they, they aren't, they're, There isn't that same interaction when you're sitting there with Mm -hmm. those rule books and those character sheets right in front of you. Um, And it's, it would take, uh, you know, strong parenting from a number of different parents. You know, you you almost need a group of role-playing parents to to bring their kids together and hope they all get together and, you know, hope they all get along in the right uh, dynamics in order to, to pass that on. Though on the other side, what they might find on YouTube is many people sitting around playing D&D, which could get them interested in role-playing, which is something we didn't have. You can now consume role-playing as entertainment, as as passively, right? You can watch, you can, as a sport, you can watch Critical Role, you can watch, oh my God, like I, I think our list has 350 different actual play YouTube channels on it, and I'm sure I don't have all of them. So there is that now that aspect of people discovering games that way. And I think in a way, 
that has replaced the I was at Kohl's and bought this weird looking red box and then went home and went, oh, my God, showed my friends. Now it's the oh, my God, I discovered this thing called Critical Role. They're playing this game called D&D. And I think that's kind of replaced it. I, again, I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just a change. It's just a shift. Yeah. Because the other thing is role playing nowadays has been around long enough that it's a verbal tradition. I don't think there's I, like people are shocked when I tell them they're like, oh, who'd you learn to role play from? I'm like, oh, I took the box off the shelf and I read it and figured it out. And people are like, oh, no one does that now. Right. Like you're always introduced to it from someone. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I I struggle a little bit because I, for me, uh, and I, this is heresy because this is something we do. I don't enjoy role playing actual plays. Um, yeah, and 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 there's a couple of different problems. I think. I mean, one you get there, there's there's two kinds, right? There's the there's the critical role, which are mm -hmm. you know the next level. There's the they are a production, and they are a problem in that they're something that most people look at as entertainment. It's a movie. Yep. It's not something they're going to do at home. Mm -hmm. It's unapproachable. Uh, whereas, you know, you get your normal average actual play, which is five people sitting around in little windows talking. Mm -hmm. That's, it struggles to be interesting. You need to have the right mix of people and the right content to connect with your viewer. And, you know, if I don't know any of those people and, and the content doesn't mean anything to me, it's, it's a struggle for me to connect with that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I sit down and I'm bored, I can turn on my, a Minecraft Let's Play video or a Fortnite Let's Play video and immediately know what's going on. And while it may not be riveting, it's immediately connective content for a lot of people, especially the youth. So I don't, based on the popularity I see of every almost almost every actual play, I think that just you're not in the norm here. I don't know if it's an age thing or what. I personally I don't like them much myself. I I first found them through podcasts, actual play podcasts, and I found there were very few I could listen through to the end. There were a couple I listened to more as uh, instructionals. That's how I learned to run Marvel heroic role playing because the rule book is terrible at getting the concepts across. Whereas listening to an actual play and I'm like, Oh, okay. That's how that works. And then when I was able to play it, it worked great. But like, I personally, I can't stand the overproduced ones, like the entertainment ones. Cause to me, I watch them and it, I don't mean, no, it's not role playing, but it's not what I'm used to seeing at the table. And it doesn't give me the feeling of being at that table and enjoying the experience. I don't, I don't, I don't get a nostalgia of, Oh, I've been there with my group and I remember that happening, which is what I tend to get from the on, non-professional ones is I, as I sit there and the other problem I have is I'm a DM and I DM for 40 years or so, not quite 30, at least 30 years, 35 years or whatever. And I am doing the terrier hair out cause I hear the mistakes and it drives me nuts. Right. <laughs> I'm like, no, don't, why, why, why? You just, you put them in a corner. All you had to do was say yes. Right. Often I'm saying, all you had to do was say yes. Because the players come up with these awesome things and the DMs just shut them down. And I'm like, no, come on. They're, they're giving, they're raking the rain. They're doing the dance in front of you. Come on, give it to them. And, and that's where I find actual plays hard to list and watch to is I can't help but judge them and think, well, this is what I'd do in that situation. See, the one actual play that I actually became involved with, and oddly enough, it was, it was very Spelljammer-ish. Um, and, and yet I still was nerd poker. Um, that was my introduction to uh, Nerd Poker. And it was because um, uh, Brian Pesain, who's a comedian who I've always enjoyed, was you know one of the major people behind it and, and, and sort of pushing that. And it felt, the reason I got into it was it felt a lot like our group, right? Mm. That we, it, was, he, it wasn't over-the-top comedy. They weren't putting on voices. It was a bunch of guys who have been sitting down at a table. It happened to be in LA, but sitting down at a table for years playing mm. who decided to put a mic down on the table and play and you got these stories of you know because they were they were entertainers for the, for the most part where they would you know stop at one point and tell the story of why this was funny so you got the background of oh, that's cool. oh you know i just threw this guy's head into a bag and everyone laughed oh well because three years ago elron the great blah 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 and and you got these stories and it, you felt like you were part of the table and it felt like a table we had been part of. Um, and, and again, th those guys are all about, around our age too. And that was, mm -hmm. I'm sure, part of it. Um, and I don't know if there are the same sort of connections out there. There, there weren't for women, that's for sure. 
uh, yeah. and and whether or not people of color or or others had that po- sort of podcast out there. That was the one I mm-hmm. knew and I connected with. Um, That's but, another advantage of going online too is the anonymity, right? Uh, especially if you're playing with uh, just text, but even with voices, you can easily match your voices, and it's allowed some pe- marginalized people be able to take it advantage of and be able to play that might not be before right so uh ryan in our chat room who is a blind meeple pointed out the move to online play means that us blind board gamer enthusiasts are generally left behind there's some options for rpgs but pretty much nothing for other forms of accessible hobby tabletop hobby game hobby whatever tabletop games um i'm surprised there isn't more like like board game arena like there are so many ways to play board games online that no one has developed a way to play them with um screen readers like in in some actually effective way yeah i like it just seems like that's a missing opportunity that that would be out there well and i think a lot of it is that i don't know if um people have made the demand necessary because i mean realistically what you need to do is go into board game arena and put in alt text for For every object in the game um and it's a lot of work and if the demand's not there if if you know, the problem with that is even with that, how do you mo- manipulate the pieces? Right. Right. That you also need some kind of like voice recognition, like, you know, move, move the pawn from B6 to C3, right? Like yeah, you yeah. need some type of interface on both sides. Like it's not just being able to see what's on the screen, but it's also being able to manipulate it. And I think that's probably the hardest part is how do you then get it and go, well, take my move call off that spot. So I take this action. Yeah. Well, and I mean, now Ryan has talked in in the past about having helper players yeah uh, and that may be the solution is you you can't do it on your you still can't do it on your own but you might not have been able to do it on your own in person either um if you i don't know if 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 the the helper is 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 able to to work with you um which again limits you because you're not as um able to work to be on your own as i'm sure everyone wants to be uh but you know, because of the nature of some games, you know, we've, we've talked in, about games that are and aren't uh, compatible with, with making readily available for uh, Ryan to play and, and some of the work mm-hmm. that he has to go through to change games up to make sure that they are as um, available for him as they, they could be. Uh, and that's with the normal, you know, board games in person. Uh, that same sort of level has to be looked at when it comes to the online uh, and as to what can and can't be done and what needs mm-hmm. to be done and what uh, what game what paths games can take to be more accessible with or without the assistance and the steps yeah taken I said one of the things Ryan's noting is that yes he could play with assistance but when asking for that assistance he's getting silence which it's unfortunate yeah so apparently there's a, there's an online Dominion implementation that's accessible and slay the spire. Uh, and some uh, fan-made Magic the Gathering apps. Available. That one makes sense because it's all the cards, right? Right. You you be able to get the cards. It's just it's kind of disappointing that's not out there. Obviously, there's not enough demand for people to have created it, and I think part of that is the the people haven't known to ask for it. Well, and part like, of the problem is I think you know a lot of the accessibility we've seen growing in demand and the the the, the growth of the industry of accessibility was forced by uh, the Americans with Disability Act. Uh, and similar similar legislation in various countries, uh, but that sort of legislation doesn't exist online, and yeah. and that's where we probably you know and and I'm not someone who is heavy on supporting legislation, especially not in the online space, but it may be something where we need a push, um, and it will probably unfortunately come from Europe because that seems to be where they're actually willing mm-hmm. to legislate online uh things but you know if, if it's going to take that sort of a push like the uh ada act in the states did to make sure that these people are being heard that may be that may be what it takes and, and you may have you know i websites proudly announcing that they are accessible yeah i would love to see it to be honest but yeah i think it needs it needs a push from somewhere yeah, maybe maybe it's a Kickstarter that someone can start on. Like, uh, I there are definitely like Ryan's mentioned them before. I'm blanking out podcasts that talk about these topics. Oh, absolutely, like, absolutely. They just need to organize, I think, and like get a hold of Board Game Arena and say, "Hey, 
can do something for us. I don't know what, but something. And if you get enough names on that petition, people might pay attention and take notice. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, and definitely, I think Board Game Arena would be the right target. I yeah, mean, like they, that's they, the one I they think. Have the, like, they have the market share right now, yeah. uh, by, by and large. Um, I, I don't know what their numbers are right now, but I know they're still ridiculously high. Yes. <laughs> um, talking about things changing once the pandemic hit and shifting to online. Man, that's, they did a good job on that site keeping up with growing uh, usage in the early days of the pandemic. That's interesting. Oh, right now, there's only actually 6,000 people online playing board that's games. That's actually way lower than it it's, was. It's Most much people lower are right back now. to work now because, yeah. you know. School and school and work are a thing again. School and uh, work are a thing in again. In whatever format. It is, it is definitely a thing. Yeah. All right. I think we'll do one more from Jeff, and then we will move on. All right. So... Why do you think that more people seem to have seem to find success making content about games than find success making games, publishing games, or even you know running a game store? Are, are there more people finding success making content about games? That's the only part I don't know. I don't know if if the basis for the the question is actually true. Um, we are successful content creators, but most people who are, I think, the big thing. Uh, is that most of the people making content aren't, I'm not saying they're failing, are not successful at making content. They're successful and in their spare time make content. Like there are people who have full-time jobs. There, there are very, very few people in both the tabletop, well, the tabletop industry and in both RPGs or board games that do it full-time. It is extremely rare. And I think that it's a lot easier if you're working a full-time job, have kids, family, and lots of obligations to produce the occasional blog post, right? Or to get together with your friend and record a podcast. We do a heck of a lot more work than most podcasters casters do because we try to put out our content on three fronts. We want audio, video, and, and text. We want people to be able to listen, watch, or read. Not everyone does that. Actually, I don't know anyone else that does that for that matter. And I'm not trying to brag. I'm just saying it's different because we have the time. This is my full-time job. I have the time to do that. And Sean works from home, so he has the time to do the editing. So he doesn't have the, the commute or anything else to get in there. And he has the, the, the free time in the office to do it in. So I think why you see more content creators out there creating content is because they're passionate about the thing. Whatever that thing happens to be, whether our board games or whatever, snorkeling, they're they're out there creating blog posts or recording podcasts. And, and part of that too is accessibility. It is really simple to record a podcast now. Like um, there's Podbean or there's a couple other ones where you just get the app on your phone and you literally hit record and talk and you're done. And then it publishes it for you and even puts ads in and you can make money on it. Uh, Anchor is another company that does that. There are, if you are into the OSR RPG, if you're into the old school AD&D first edition style, Anchor became the haven for that type of player in that group. There are hundreds of OSR podcasts on there because everyone has a, had a phone and they could figure out how to hit record and put it out on there. So I think that's the big thing is, is, is content. I don't want to say content creation is easy, but when compared to making a game or publishing a game now running game stores is something completely different. I think the only reason it's easier to make content than run a game store is I think game stores are almost impossible to be profitable in today's day and age. You can't just be a store that sells games. Try try and be a bookstore, for instance. You know, it's, yeah, it's, like it's, just <laughs> trying to be a bookstore, right? You have to have something special there to draw people in. And with the pandemic going on, like I'm amazed that our local stores are still open. Like, like, because there's no reason to go there now. <laughs> like, like I don't know. Some of them are still running events and trying to be safe and social distance and masks, whatever. I personally too high risk to, to even consider checking it out myself. But they're they're struggling, right? So I don't know. I, I, I think that's what it is, is that, that most content about games is hobby content. It, it's successful people using their spare time to talk about and create things for things they're passionate about. They're passion projects. They're not businesses, right? They're not the, the, they're, they're the other thing, like there is no success to be had, like except for pride, right? Like they're, they're doing it as because they love doing it. So they're not worrying about making it for that matter. It's it's a uh, a lot of it is sort of again what you decide decide define as success, uh, and, and and what you're what you're looking for and what you're what you're trying to achieve. So you can make a board game, and it will probably take you, say, three years. Uh, just uh, throwing throwing some random numbers out here. So three years 
to work through from a great idea and play testing it and marketing it and getting the Kickstarter out there and working through. And then you finally see a profit. Maybe <laughs> if you're lucky. Maybe. Um, so having that game out there and then you've got to do another game. And so that's another three years and maybe that overlaps or maybe it doesn't, maybe you're going to go have a three year gap in there. Um, and so the, the time investment to get mm -hmm. a, a something out there, like a, a game is, is huge. Uh, even, even writing an RPG manual. I mean, that's not, you know, you're looking the work of, of, the concepts and the the writing and then the edit, the editing process and layouts and all that stuff takes forever. Whereas we can sit down and in four hours put out a RPG or a, sorry a Gloomhaven FAQ <laughs> that's based off of someone else's content and with our own you know based off of someone else's content with our own twist and our own discussion and dialogue over our that. Our own bitter banter. <laughs> our own bitter banter. There we go. And and turn that into something. And for us, that was successful. But yeah. what that means for successful is not a financial thing. I mean, that no. did nothing and probably never will do anything financially for us. Uh, the, the, the two years we've spent on this podcast have been successful in many ways, uh, but not really financially. Um, mm -hmm. They've gotten us to, to meet and know great people and great connections, uh, gotten an opportunity to play games we may never have gotten our hands mm -hmm. on otherwise. Uh, and that's a personal success that, that we were looking for and we wanted and we got. Uh, but it has been two years of slogging to barely make the bare minimum YouTube level, for instance, of, yeah. of you know making a few cents on a video view. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so far, our Gloomhaven FAQ, our most popular YouTube video of all time that has thousands of views, has made us a dollar seventy-two. Yeah, that's so. Again, it's it's how you look at success. I think that Gloomhaven uh, FAQ is hugely successful, but in a financial sense, it ain't. No. Um, or compared to videos about how to make a cake. <laughs> I mean, you know? yeah, I mean, right? you got like, you know, and again, we are a very niche uh, topic, right? Yep. The, the the best board game people out there aren't massive when you compare them no. to and again I, I, I me and my kids do minecraft a lot so minecraft is my first thing you know some of the top minecraft players have millions and millions mm -hmm. of subscribers uh yeah. and you know they drop a video and in the first 10 minutes they've got two hundred thousand views yeah uh we Which will never see more that. than a dollar seventy <laughs> we will we will never see that but that's okay because we're not in a, a market that can support 1.5 million mm. <laughs> subscribers. Yeah, we, I, I talk about it, right? I do this full time, but it's not the podcast. It's everything of mine. It's not the podcast. It's not the, the, the blog. It's not like it's all of it combined. And still the majority of the money becomes because I share deals on games on Twitter, which has nothing to do with the podcast or anything else, except they happen to be games like that. That's it. The only thing keeping us afloat, which is sad because pretty much all our eggs are in one basket, right? Like we got a couple of in there, but they're like, you know, quail eggs versus you know <laughs> the the big goose egg that that is amazon right now um so that's why we appreciate like people like our patrons and stuff like that like you look at how much we make on patreon and how much we get from twitch and how much and like you add that up and i'm like that would probably be able to support my hobby of buying games and playing them myself and that's what it did for years it's just that now we're doing a bit more so i i don't know the the thing a lot of people don't realize and i have no idea if jeff knows this or not is that people don't have success making games stefan felt is we talk about all the time has a day job like this is a person who releases one to five games a year is considered one of the best game designers on the planet his games are instant hits when they sell people buy them based on his name is still a principal at a school and not i, I don't know if it's by choice or not but like the fact or if you get into role playing you start talking about like Wizards of the Coast, I don't know if this number is still true, but the last time I checked employs eight people. RPG books are written by a heck of a lot more than eight people. Wizards yeah. of the Coast, Hasbro, funded role-playing division is only able to employ eight people. That's it. 
And there's stuff like PR managers and stuff. They're not necessarily game designers. I don't even know if Wizards of the Coast currently has a game designer on, on role. It's just, they're not, game designing is not really a, a full-time job. It is not something you get success at. Game publishers tend to be, have jobs and then finally make it. So an example is Stronghold Games, I think it was two years ago now, was finally Stephen Bonacore of Stronghold. He's now retired, actually. He's done well enough. But was able to quit his full-time job, which was being a stock trader on the New York Stock Exchange, where he literally went downtown New York to run Stronghold Games full-time. And that took him 12 years, I think, before he was able to get to the point he was able to do that. And then eventually he was able to merge with another company and things went great. But like I, the, the amount of success in this industry is very small when you think of it as, are you able to support a life from that hobby? It, it is minuscule, the number of people who manage to pull it off. I mean, you look at, let's, let's, let's look at Critical Role, right? Critical Role is a massive success and no one is denying that. But it was almost the end of their first season before they were make, able to make minimum wage. Uh, now they're doing well now. I mean, no, yep, I, and I don't know what their and I don't know what their numbers are. I, but uh, all the research I'm able to do shows that you know in that first season, again, it took them a, a, a season to make minimum wage. Um, and so and all of, of those people, people at, the, at the time had other jobs. Yeah, like they, they also did critical role. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's one of those things where, again, even even getting the big numbers doesn't necessarily mean success in a financial way, even yeah. if as I, you know, within our hobby, it's a massive success. Yeah. And then like I said, game stores, I'm shocked anyone can pull it off. Like to yeah, be honest, I, I don't know. Like, yeah. like collectible card games is the only thing keeping them going. And even without that, I don't know. Yeah. Like our local game store has started to branch out into gunpla, which is cool because there's a bunch of locals that support it. So that the, your secret as a game store is find out what the local gamers want and provide it, right? Yeah. Whether that's a game space or it's cheap prices, like if you have to make 1% on all your games and sell enough games to make money, like that might be your secret I mean, is to, to be able to offer the cheap prices. But more likely, you need to find that thing that you can't do. You offer painting classes so that people buy your paints and models or you have a place to play or whatever. Like I said, with the pandemic, I, I'm amazed that our yeah. local stores are still here. I really am. Like, like thumbs up for everyone who's still supporting them. That's awesome. Absolutely. I, Love I your don't FLGS. know how they're making it. I mean, I, you know, I, I, and I have to say, I, you know, I supported my FLGS, my, my game, the game, you know, Spectaculars, which still hasn't gotten unboxed yet. Yeah. Um, I, I had the chance to order it online, but I would have had to wait. And the option was there to order it through my local FLGS. So I did. I called them up and I probably paid a little more than I would have uh, ordering it straight through the website. But I was happy to support them. Uh, and I went there and it was great. You know, they had they had masks available at the door. They had uh, um, sanitizer right there at the door. And I walked in and they stayed away from me and I stayed away from them. Mm -hmm. Put the game on the counter and was on my way. But... And now that's it for this month's AMA. Thank you to everyone who joined us live tonight and presented us with questions, as well as those who couldn't be here, but took time to send in questions ahead of time. Uh, finally, if you've got a game or game night question for us, you can head over to the website, click on ask the bellhop, or just send us an email questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Today, we're going to take a look at Azul Summer Pavilion, the third game in the Azul series of tile drafting games. Uh, so the third version of Azul, Azul Summer Pavilion, was designed by Michael Kiesling and features art from Chris Quilliams. Note, this is the same designer. The last two Azul games are all Michael Kiesling, but this is a new artist. It was published in 2019 by a number of different publishers around the world. My personal version, which is the Canadian edition, was from Next Move Games. While this wasn't a review copy, we still took the time to record an unboxing video for this new version of Azul. You can check that out on the YouTube channel. Uh, you can also get a full component list over on the blog version of this review. Uh, for tonight, though, I do just want to highlight a few things component-wise. So first off, the rules are excellent. I think this is an example of a rule book that has more examples than rules, which actually I think is fantastic, especially in an abstract game like this. Second, there's a central market bonus board in this game. It's different from the other as well. Something that goes on the table in front of everyone. And I got to complain about this a bit because it is made of thin cardstock. 
which I wouldn't complain about if everything was thin card stock, but the main player boards are standard board game mounted boards. And I just think it's odd. Like why, why give me nice player boards, but a lousy center market? Yeah, it's a strange mismatch to be certain. And while I'm sure there were costs and other considerations that to put them to it, it makes that player center board feel like an afterthought. And that hurts the sort of concept, the feel of the game. It really does. Also disappointing here is the factory tiles, which are the round tiles you put out and draft things from, don't have anything on them to help colorblind vision problems. Which normally I could call it lots of games that don't help out colorblind people, but this is something that they put in to stained glass of Sintra, the last Azul game. And I think it's just, I, I just thought it would be there. Like they put it in Sintra. That was brilliant. Carry that over. But they didn't. And I, I think that would have been cool. Now, they did add in one thing that was in Sintra, which is a tower to put the discarded tiles in. So thanks for that. But sorry, colorblind people, we're not helping you out this time. And overall, between the tower and, tower and the center market, this game spreads out enough that mm. you're not able to slip it onto a little coffee shop table the way you were with the original. Yeah, I got to admit that once we get to my final thoughts, I did skip over that. One of the things I love so much about the original was Deanna and I would bring it for date nights at bars and pubs. This is not as portable as the original game. Uh, speaking of the tiles themselves, because that's a main feature of all Azul games, these are a little different. They're not squares anymore. These are more elongated diamonds. Uh, only half of them have symbols on them. So again, with the colorblind thing, I, I have to assume the other three colors are different enough with most types of colorblindness, but there are only symbols on half of them. Uh, the quality is the same. You got that same plastic thing, but they, they, they don't look like calls or, or um, uh, what is that? Jolly Ranchers anymore, which I, so I don't want to eat them. Well, I guess we'll chalk that up as a win. <laughs> now that we know, are done talking about the non-edible components, how about you give us an overview of how Azul Summer Pavilion plays? All right, so Azul Summer Pavilion, instead of building a wall, now you're building a floor. Uh, you are competing against each other, drafting tiles from a shared marketplace, placing them onto personal player boards and to set patterns in order to earn points. In this version of Azul, you will also earn the opportunity to earn bonus tiles from a central bonus board. The game plays over a total of six rounds, and in each of those six rounds, one of the tile colors is wild, which is an interesting new addition. At the end of six rounds, player with the most points wins the game. Which, aside from the central board and the wild tile bit, sounds a lot like another game called Azul. Yeah, there are definitely things that are the same in all versions of the game. It, it, this is one of those things where they didn't just put out another game with the same name that's completely different. You're like, are you just cashing in on the name? No, there's definitely a same, similar basis for all three of these games. Now, setup's dead simple as it is in most of these. You're going to take a player board. You're going to put your scoring marker on five. You're going to put a round marker on round one. You're going to fill the bonus market with 10 random tiles. Place out the factories and fill each of those with four tiles and put the first player token in the middle. That's it. Dead simple. No real setup to be spoken of as far as I'm concerned. Uh, each round is broken into two phases. First is the acquire phase. Here, players draft tiles. And second is the play phase, where players play the tiles they drafted in the first phase. Now, note, this is a big change from the other two Azul games, where players place their tiles immediately upon drafting them. In Summer Pavilion, instead, players make a pile of tiles they've drafted in phase one, and then don't actually place them on their player boards until phase two. This deceptively simple timing change becomes a massive change in gameplay as you're able to change and adapt your plans throughout the entire draw phase based on what else is happening from other people and what tokens are left, unlike mm -hmm. the original Azul, where you're, you, you make that choice and that's your choice. And if something better turns up later, too bad, you've already used a spot. Yep. Now, every round, one color is wild. I mentioned that earlier. This color changes every round. And what I thought was interesting is it's the same every game it's always purple first and ends with whatever color i'm actually a little surprised you don't draw randomly out of the bag to determine that order i'm not sure what the reason is for that. so getting into the two phases i'll explain them quickly you have the acquire phase where you have two choices you can pick one factory and a color other than the current rounds wild color you're going to take all the color all the tiles of that color from the factory as well as one and only one tile of the wild color if present Anything still left on the factory gets put into the central market in the middle of the factories. 
or you can take from the central market where again you're going to take one color and you're going to take the tiles the exact same you're going to take all of the color and one and only one wild tile if there are any there the first player to go to that central market does get penalized but they get the first player token they're going to go first next round the penalty here though is the number of tiles you took not counting the first player token you're going to lose one point each you keep going around the table till every tile is drafted Right. So it's it's very similar and very familiar to players of Azul, but especially with the wild card, mm. re, uh, the wild tile um, is enough of a twist to, to throw you off. And, and you, you need to pay attention uh, mm -hmm. because it's not Azul. It's Azul Summer Pavilion. Correct. And that, that first player token losing points is definitely different too, where in the old Azuls that you take it and you get minus two points. Well, now it's also based on how many tiles you took with it, which can be a big change where you might not want to grab too many at once. Whereas I found in the original game players like, well, I'm going to do it and lose two points because I'm going to get a ton of tiles. Now the playing tiles phase, this is definitely a little more complicated. So in turn order, players may either place a set of tiles or pass. Once you pass, you're out for the rest of the round. Tile placement is done by picking one of the colors, one of the six colors, and picking one to six tiles of that color that you've collected, and then covering up a spot on your board that matches that color and that number. You're then going to put one on the board, and the rest get discarded. So if you play five, you're going to put one on the board, and four are going to go into the discard. The current round's wild color can be combined with any other color. So if you're trying to do five red, you could have one red and four purples, if purple is wild. Um, you can use these to make sets and you can technically also use the wild card as their themselves. So if purple's wild, you could place purple. Now each player board has six spots for each of the six colors, all numbered one through six, and they kind of look like stars. And then the center of the board is a wild part. Now wild can be any color, but when it's being completed, you can only have one of each color. So each point on the star has to be one of the six different colors. So the number of ways you can try and tackle the puzzle of tile laying is really almost as much of a game in itself as the original was on its own. Mm. Uh, do you start at the high numbers and work your way down? Do you do one color at a time in the florets? Uh, do you just play what you can get and work it out? Uh, I have seen, you know, I've only played this game you know, four or five times, but I've seen a lot of different strategies employed mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to 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 best fill your card or even not fill your card but still maximize points mm -hmm. now in addition to this on the board are some special decorations right so again you're making a floor so in between some of the patterns are statues pillars and windows anytime a player has covered all the spots surrounding one of these they get bonus tiles from that bonus tile card we were talking about earlier like pillars are worth one statues two and windows worth three What's really fascinating and does, changes the strategy a lot is these tiles can be used immediately in that phase. So you are getting more tiles as you go. And as soon as you buy tiles, after your turn's done, they're replaced for the next player. So the bonus area doesn't run out. Yeah, and this adds a whole other twist to that whole complexity of how to lay out your card. Because you're no longer worrying about just florets. You can skip the florets and focus on just trying to get all your bonuses as fast as you can or on a certain kind of bonus to max that out. It's, it, it really gets complex mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's hard to understand how many different ways it can play out if you're just used to that original as well. Yeah. And then to make things even more interesting, you're going to get points for these tiles placed too. And trying to score the tiles is a little bit interesting. So the first tile place. So it's the first one on a floor it gets one point. And then any other tiles placed are going to get one point for the tile and one point for any adjacent tile in a cluster. So you count all the same color or the same uh, flora, everything in the same, wouldn't necessarily be the same color because you might be on the wild tile, but it's like the number who are now touching each other, you're going to get one point for. And then there's the fact that once you're done, you can pass. And here's a big change from the original Azul is any leftover tiles in your playing area have to be dealt with, and you can keep four between rounds. Now, any tiles that can't be saved after that are discarded and cost players one point each. Right. And this, this seems simple, you know, oh, I got a couple left over, I'm going to save them. But it can become a huge factor in your ability 
to even possibly score some of the higher numbers in later parts of the game. Yeah. Now, at the end of each round, um, everyone's passed, everyone's done. You refill the factories, four tiles each. The round marker goes in the next spot, which changes which color is wild again, and the game continues. At the end of the sixth round, players can no longer store any more tiles. So anything that's left over at the end of that is going to cost you points. And then you're going to get a bunch of bonus points. So you get bonus points for each completed star on your board and based on its color and for covering up full sets of numbers. And it's not all the numbers. It's only some of them, but I don't think it's worth getting into the details of which here. And that's pretty much it. Now, there is a variant. The boards are two-sided, and on the second side, it's blank, so none of the colors are there. And you get to determine as you play which colors each florette's going to be until, like, as you place the first tile. And what's interesting here is you could build multiple sets of the same color, or you can do multiple all-color stars, too. Yeah, even though I've played a few times, and I've played the original Azul many times, I've still got more than enough things I want to try to not want to add that blank side uh, level of difficulty yeah. slash confusion in. And similar to the blank side on Azul, despite what you may think, it's not easier. <laughs> You're like, oh, it's easy. I can play stuff everywhere. No, trust me. <laughs> it's, it requires much more strategy. Yep. Now, long-term fans of the show probably remember when Azul came out because we basically couldn't shut up about it. <laughs> um, it really won us both over in, in the rest of the gaming community, to be honest, as well, and quickly became one of my go-to gateway games. This was the game that I packed with me anytime I went to a public play event because this was the perfect game for new gamers and non-gamers and people who didn't know what they wanted to play. Like, people, oh, I played Monopoly in that, but I kind of want to try some modern games. Azul was the go-to. While that attachment has waned some over time, <laughs> it is still unquestionably a solid game and I can't imagine turning it down if someone pulled it out and asked me to play. No, I agree. It's definitely not one I'm going to say no. Now, a year later, Azul Stained Glass of Sintra was released. I got a chance to check that one out thanks to one of our fans, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, this was Joe's first taste of Azul, and he loved it. And I got to admit, I like it. I like Stained Glass of Sintra. I still have it in my collection, but it doesn't get played nearly as often as the original. It just doesn't have the approachability of the original Azul. Like, it's just much more fiddly. It's harder to teach. The scoring is more complicated. There's more things to keep track of. Plus, it um, the scoring strategies were weird. Like, like how to play well was harder. It wasn't as, as obvious. Uh, this basically made the game more of a, a gamer's game, right? And there are a lot of gamers out there who think it's the best version of Azul. It, 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 there's more strategy required, there's more tactics, there's system mastery, the more you play, the better you get. There's chess-like feels to it. All of that's great, and I get it. But for me, despite being a heavy game fan, for this abstract, I'd rather play the original as well. Yeah, and I completely agree. It, it didn't have uh, what I think is the selling point of the original Azul, well, and that's the casualness, right? Part of the attraction of the original was, while not a filler, you could relax at a coffee shop and play Azul mm -hmm. rather than Sintra where you were sitting there focused on everything and, you know, you didn't want to be in a coffee shop because the person trying to make a espresso at the, you know, over there was distracting you and, and mm -hmm. frustrating you because you were so focused on your scoring uh, thoughts. So now we come to Azul Summer Pavilion, uh, the game we're reviewing tonight. To me, this newest version of Azul finds a place between the other two. It features significantly more depth than the original Azul, with at the same time being less punishing and less cutthroat. Because the depth of Summer Pavilion comes from a combination of the scoring system and the pattern building system for owning the bonus tiles, like getting those at the right time and being able to use them. By having the players all draft all their tiles at first, then place them separate, there's fewer chances you get stuck with something you can't use or get, get hosed by the other players. This, combined with the fact players can save up to four tiles, again, makes the Summer Pavilion much less punishing and much less cutthroat than the other its predecessors. It's a lot harder to hate draft in Summer Pavilion and, and stick someone with something. Now, while these changes do make it more approachable, the scoring system is definitely more involved than the original, and I have had players have a hard time grasping the scoring system. Yeah, I, I think we both agree on Syndra. 
And for me, there are two things that keep the original just slightly ahead of Summer Pavilion. And, and space, again, we talked about it once, and I'm going to start bringing yeah. up again. Summer Pavilion just isn't as nice for a quick anywhere setup. You need a table. Like, you need that space to, for everyone to, to be able to reach and, and, and you know, see everything and, and work on. And then, two, the scoring is obtuse. <laughs> I know I have seen, and I'm pretty sure I have made mistakes <laughs> in the scoring. Uh, I would actually love a digital mobile version of this game as I, I'm almost certain I would sit and play against a half-decent AI even when I was bored and had 20 minutes or half an hour to kill uh, because it, it has that that nice, thinky, but also uh, relaxed feel to it mm -hmm. when you don't have to worry about your scoring and making yeah. sure that you, you haven't messed up somewhere or, or you know you dropped all the right things in the right place. So overall, I think Azul Summer Pavilion hits a sweet spot for me in the Azul series. Has a bit more meat and depth than the original without becoming too fiddly or complex. I, and it's still easily approachable. Well, I still think the overall game, the, the overall, the original game is a better gateway game. It's just the, the scoring, Scrabble scoring, the the it's really basic. It's easy to teach as you play the first time. I do personally think it's worth teaching new players Azul and then moving on to Sovereign Pavilion shortly thereafter. Once they've got the basic drafting system and placing titles to earn points, moving on to this, because I find it more rewarding. It's a more enjoyable game for me. The added depth here is going to appeal more to experienced gamers as well. Though, no, it's not going to scratch that brain-burning itch that Sintra might. If you're, if you're looking for more of a challenge, you're probably going to look to the, third, the, the second game in the series. Now, of the three games, Summer Pavilion is my current favorite. It's it's the version of Azul I'm most excited to play the most often. That said, each of the three games does feel significantly different from each other, despite using the same basic drafting system of drafting tiles to place them into patterns. All three versions see play often enough that I'm happy I own all of them. It's just that if someone came over and said, hey, you want to play some Azul? I don't care which type. I'm going to grab Summer Pavilion. I would agree long as you've got the space for a slightly more in-depth look at azul summer pavilion you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews well let's take a look at scooby-doo escape from the haunted mansion a puzzle-filled mystery game uh from the op before we start our investigation i do have to thank the op for providing us with a review copy of this game so to start off, I want to make sure everyone knows what game I'm talking about here. Here I'm talking about Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, a puzzle game for one or more players. I'm not talking about Scooby-Doo Betrayal at Mystery Mansion, which is a Scooby-Doo themed version of Betrayal at House on the Hill. Unfortunately, both of these games came out pretty much at the same time like i even think within weeks of each other and they feature very similar names and this has caused confusion for a number of gamers myself included yeah the escape and betrayal are of course the keywords to look for but it can be hard to pick those out sometimes especially if you're in a rush and you got a lot of media coming at you so scooby-doo escape from the haunted mansion was designed by jay cormier sen fu lim and cami mandel it features cartoony artwork by Rob Lundy and Rick Hutchinson. Uh, this is an escape room in a box style game that can be played with one or more players. Now, playtime is listed as an hour or two on Board Game Geek. I will note nowhere on the box does it list this. So that's been submitted by someone on Board Game Geek. I got to say, it could be anywhere. It's really going to depend on your group's problem solving ability, but even more so their sense of exploration. This game is broken up into two chapters, which is kind of cool, and you can save between them. So you could play it all in one sitting, so it's it's you might fit it. I think you'd need a fairly long game night, but you can split it up into two. Right, and it's great to see some familiar and Canadian names there, mm -hmm. as well as fellow podcasters. Now, similar to other puzzle games, like the Exit series of games reviewed in the past, this is a one-and-done game. This is a, you play it once and only once, and it's done with. There are envelopes that you're going to open during play. That said, nothing is actually destroyed while playing this game. Plus, the envelopes actually come with stickers that are fairly resealable, I've noticed. So it is possible when you finish this game to maybe pass it on to another group. 
though all the envelopes will have been opened once, but you can shove the stuff back in. Actually, as you play, it tells you to put stuff back into the envelopes. Well, to get a pretty much spoiler-free look at what you get in the box for this game, check out our Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion unboxing video on YouTube. The only thing we show off is the first room where you start the game and the first clue card, which is unlocked very early in the game. Don't read off any of the text from the books, so you don't have to worry about anyone ruining the game in any way. As a bonus, everything blue is hidden. Yes, it is true. Which does some weird things with the windows in the first room. And we get to the shaggy. It looks really impressive because his background is gone. Now, in regards to the components, I do have a few things I do want to talk about here and highlight even here on the podcast. And one of the things I like is the box. Uh, this is not your standard board game box. It's not the lid slides off the top, but rather a like, like a pizza box. You can flip open the front and it opens up. Um, most of what you get in the box are booklets. Now these are thin, like I, I, they're floppy, they're floopy. I don't know how to describe it. Uh, there is one called the mystery manual, which is very quickly goes over the rules. Like, like I, lightning quick. This is the kind of thing where you don't have to prep ahead of time. You can crack this open with your friends. You're going to play with that night and get through it quickly. And then there are five other books, one for each of the mystery ink team. Uh, there is a thin card standee for each character as well. No, very thin. Now, the rest of the contents are a stack of room cards, a deck of clue cards, and a number of sealed envelopes that you open during play. Now, don't do what I did. Don't throw the box insert out. There's a purple box insert in there, which I actually first thought was completely pointless, especially because, like I said, the floopy books were kind of flooping down inside it. Well, it may seem useless. It does actually help because what it lets you do is shut the lid properly, which I totally missed out on. No, actual pizza box makers have managed without it for years, so I'm not quite sure why it's required. Well, the thing is, pizza's round, right? So the pizza just goes round where square stuff isn't. And what happens is the decks of cards slide into the corners, the back corners, and when you try to close it, it catches on them. So you need everything in the middle to actually close it properly. And while well, that organizer had a nice gap on the sides and a spot, a trough in the middle. So there, there was a reason for it. I now know. Well, now that we have some idea of what you get, how do you use all these cards, books, and standees? Well, you start off the game, uh, a, a game of Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, by reading chapter 5,000 in Fred's book. Now, I don't want to spoil anything here. I am not going to tell you exactly what happens. What I do want to talk about is the Coded Chronicles system, because this is actually game one in a system, a series of games that are going to use the same mechanics. At any given point during the game, you're going to have one or more room tiles face up on the table. Each of those is going to have a number of features on it denoted by numbers. Um, most of these are three-digit numbers. Along with a revealed room, you're going to, it's going to tell you how many characters are there. And you're going to have standees representing who's in the room. Now, each of the characters in the game are going to have a specialty. Now, for the Scooby-Doo version, Velma can research, Shaggy can eat things, Daphne can use things, Scooby can smell things, and Fred can investigate things. Now, to actually use a skill, each character standee also has a number on it. And what you do is you line up the number on the standee with what they want to use their skill with. And then what that does is it gives you a four-digit number, and you then look up that four-digit number in the appropriate book, and everyone's book is numbered differently. Like I said, Fred, you look at 5,000. Well, all of Fred's entries are 5,000s. So, player two, or icon character two, with location 403, means you read out section 2,430 from the book that has all the 2,000 sections. Yep. Pretty simple. Now, some features only have two digits on them. What that means is you need to find an object to interact with it. So if you have a door that just says 23 and you've got your four, well, 423 isn't enough numbers to actually look anything up. So you've got to find something. Objects like keys and whatever else all have one digit on them. Once you have a digit and a number, you combine them together. So you have the person, the object, and the feature gives you a four-digit number. You look it up. What's really interesting and actually rather fan fascinating about this game that adds a lot to it is that all skills can be used with all features. So yes, you can have Shaggy try to eat the table in the first room. Well, they really had to put a lot of writing into this to fill out all the options from yes. the ridiculous to the required. Exactly. Uh, you should have been there, actually. Like, like I, I almost wish we had an actual play, except it would spoil it. 
Um, but when the kids figured out they could have Shaggy use his eat skill on the butler, I haven't heard that much giggling at my game table ever with my girls. Like I've heard them play another game, but like playing a board game together. And then even more so was when Big G sighed with relief, like, oh, when he didn't actually devour the butler. Instead, asked him where he could get some food and where the kitchen was. Like she literally thought in the game he was going to eat the butler somehow, which I thought was hilarious. Zoinks, Jeeves, where's the kitchen at? Yeah. So as you go through and do this, you've got your one room, your one character, whatever. As you do this, you're going to unlock new rooms and clue cards, which may have more features on them. And these will lead to some puzzles to be solved. And at various points during this story, you're going to be instructed to open a secret envelope. Now, this game comes with eight secret envelopes, all that have a mix of different things in them. So not only are the books non-linear to keep things obscure, but you also have sealed aspects that you can't even get to to mess things up. Yep. Now, when trying to solve a puzzle, um, you do have the option to spend Scooby snacks for clues. These also are concern, consumed if you make a mistake. So you'll read a passage that says, like, uh, if you tried to eat the table, you got a splinter, spend a Scooby stack or something. Um, or entering the wrong code to open a locked door, for example. Now, all of this leads to a final mystery that you're attempting to solve, as well as trying to escape from the haunted mansion. And what's fascinating here is that your final score, which is based on the number of Scooby snacks you do, is also based on whether you solve the mystery or not. So you can actually escape the haunted mansion, but fail to solve the mystery, which I thought was an interesting choice. And Deanna and I were having a debate on whether or not in the Scooby-Doo show, if they ever got it wrong. And I think there were episodes where they like pulled the hat off, expecting it to be the butler and it was actually someone else. So I think that's actually a really good representation of the series. And I thought it was neat. Like it, you can you can get a perfect score and not spend a single Scooby stat, but still get the mystery wrong. And I like how there were both options. Like we solved it, Scoobs. So as for my final thoughts, um, I got to start by saying I was not a huge Scooby-Doo fan growing up at all. Um, it was definitely something I saw. It was on. To, from my memory of it, it was one of those things where like a good Saturday morning cartoon would come on and then there'd be Scooby-Doo and I'd sit through it for the better cartoon that was coming up next. I couldn't tell you the order of the stuff that went growing up, but that was it. Now, it wasn't really my jam. I totally get using this license for making family-friendly horror games, right? Um, games that are spooky instead of scary, and therefore much more approachable for families. As an adult gamer with kids, I think it's awesome to see Scooby-Doo games. Yeah, well, I, I was a pretty big Scooby-Doo fan. I even got my kids into it at a pretty early age. I found the sheer content and volume of <laughs> Scooby content a bit overwhelming. I mean, it is a marketing mammoth, even without board games. Yeah. See, my kids know of it. They, they, they had a comic book or something, but they weren't huge fans. So to be honest, there's a good indication that you don't need to know Scooby to play this at all. There's nothing. You might get some of the inside jokes a bit more. And you might be wondering, why the heck does this dog talk? Or why does he talk so silly? But because that is the one thing my kids had a real hard time trying to figure out how to pronounce. Ruh -ruh -ruh. That was one they just didn't know what to do with. They're like, what does that say? But that's just growing up with it. I had to actually grab a YouTube snippet so I could play it for him. So the problem with this marketing mammoth that is Scooby-Doo, of course, is the brand confusion that arose that I mentioned earlier. Like I first heard this is Scooby-Doo featuring a betrayal of House on the Hill coming out. I mentioned on the show before, I am not a big betrayal fan. So I was like, eh, I don't care. And then Gen Con Online, I happened to be watching a ton of panels and doing game demos while watching game demos. And I happened to see Escape from the Haunted Mansion on it. And I'm like, oh, cool. And I sat and watched it and I'm like, huh, this is very different. Like there's room tiles like Betrayal of House on the Hill, but they're being used in a different way. Like they're combining standees with character abilities with the environment. This is awesome. This is such a cool concept, which I now know is the whole Coded Chronicle system. But at the time I was like, wow, what a weird twist on, on Betrayal of House on the Hill. So the few weeks later, I see my local game stores got in Betrayal at Mystery Manor. And I'm like, sweet, I'm going to have to get a copy. Like, despite being someone who consumes a ton of board game media, 
and and announcements i missed completely that there were two different scooby-doo games released at the same time and it wasn't until seeing this copy at the, well it wasn't i didn't see it the covid was going on and someone sent me pictures ian sent me some pics and i'm like that doesn't look like the game i saw I, I had no clue there were two different scooby-doo games out and even today i was on board game geek and i was in the rule forum for this game and i saw people asking questions about the betrayal game there was a question about when the betrayer comes out and I'm like, well, wrong game. So there are currently more than 50 different Scooby-Doo branded games listed on BGG right now. Wow. Going all the way back to the seventies. It is a crowded license. Yeah. It, in the blog version of this review, I call it another one that was released the same week, but this one's for four plus. So you can tell I'm not going to get those confused, but they did put out another one. Like it was just all of a sudden. So anyway, back to the game I actually saw the demo of and though I was all excited about is this one, Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. My fascination with the Coded Chronicle system from that review did not change. It didn't end. Like, this is such a cool way to present a mystery and puzzle game. Like, I, I found this so much cooler than the code wheel with three digits to draw a card. Like, it's just so well done. I love the different combination of the character abilities and how each of them interacts with the various rooms and objects and how it all works. And what this gives you is an actual sense of exploration as you move around rooms to room and furnitures and look at paintings and everything. Another aspect I liked was that not one player controls one character. Well, it does make sense to split the work by giving each character to a different player. There's no reason one player can't do all the reading. The game rules say one or more players, and it's legit. The problem with this, though, comes up th is that this is a cooperative game. And it is a puzzle game like this. The alpha gamer can be a problem, especially with everyone able to control everyone. A dominant player could easily take over the game and, and, and run it from the top of the table. Now, that is going to be dependent on your group. Like, you know, if you have an alpha gamer in your group that can handle playing Scooby-Doo with you and you probably know who that player is, you might want to avoid it and tell them, hey, you know what? When we're done, we'll give you our copy. And you can go through it yourself. I don't know. So and uh, and no bonus points for doing the voices. No, we, we there is the other advantage of my kids not knowing the license, <laughs> I think, in a way. Now, there is another issue with. If you do do the each player controls one character and I don't want to give anything away why, but there are points in the game where not everyone's there. Uh, there the people come and go as the story evolves. And because of that, if you actually do a sign like, hey, you play this person. Well, what do they do if that character is not present? Right. And that's a pretty standard trope within the Scooby-Doo TV show. They split the party a lot in that show. Uh, they are not good role players. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, so it's not surprising to see that uh, duplicated in the game yep. when it really does seem like they have tried very strongly to to sort of replicate that feeling of the TV shows as mm -hmm. best they can. Now, one aspect of the game I really appreciated that wasn't obvious in the demo I watched is how clean the game is in a way. Because starting off, you quickly become almost overwhelmed with clues. Like the first couple rooms, it's just like you're putting cards and cards and cards out. And there are cards that at the end of it, like you don't need till way later. Like it's it's not little compartments. It's not compartmentalized in any way for the puzzles. But when you do solve a puzzle, it'll have you put a bunch of the cards away, which I thought was really nice. So I kind of like the way the game cleaned up after itself as you played. Well, that's always a, a nice touch if you can be, uh, you know, when you're done the game, the cleanup's almost already done for yeah. you. As for the puzzles, um, we found them to be mostly just difficult enough. Like some you breeze through, like you see it, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's obvious. But others required some thought. Um, there was one that took us quite a bit of time and tempted us to look up a clue, but we did uh, figure it out before going that far. There is one issue um, where we actually got stuck, unfortunately where there is a during the chapter break it tells you to confirm that you have everything you need to go forward and it missed an item now this is something i think most groups wouldn't miss but we did happen to miss it and because it wasn't on the list of stuff you need for the next chapter we didn't know we were missing it and actually hit a dead end which kind of sucked so we actually I, I that's why i was online on board game geek looking the game up was trying to figure out what we missed and it ends up that we missed something in an earlier room again it's probably it's at I wouldn't think it easy to miss clues, so I'm not sure how we missed it, but we did miss it. And 
penalizing in the game, what should happen is we spend a Scooby snack. Like it's written that way. So here's what you should have to go forward. And if you're missing any of it, get it now and spend a Scooby snack for each one you missed. So game wise, it should just cost us a Scooby snack. Oh, we missed something very obvious, but because that item wasn't on the list, we didn't know that. So now we were able to continue because I figured out what we missed and we were able to get it and we just marked off a Scooby snack. So that was a little disappointing. Uh, one of the things to note though, because of this, this game took us way longer than the two hours that, that yeah, I expected to spend playing the game because we spent a lot of time stuck on this one puzzle. And that is going to be the thing that it's going to affect playtime for everyone. Because unlike the exit games, you're not on a timer. You're not rushing. Uh, like, except, well, maybe you're like our first night, the kid's bedtime. But what will happen is you're going to spend a variable amount of time on this, depending on how much you want to explore. And if you just rush through it, like, you know, the Scooby's not supposed to eat the uh, it's, or whatever. Shaggy's not supposed to eat the butler. You know, that's not going to lead anywhere, but you can do it. And how much, especially with kids, they're going to want to do it. That's going to affect it. Yeah. It's one of those things where I think any, the only way you can put time frames on a game is if there are time based scoring, right? So yeah. if you've got like an escape room where if you finish it in 40 minutes, you get the gold or if you finish it in 60 minutes, you get silver or whatever, that sort of thing. Uh, you can put a time limit on it, but otherwise, and especially a family game like this, um, I, it, I don't know why they shouldn't be putting times on the boxes. And, well, they didn't. Uh, and no, they, they don't. Absolutely. And it's, it's sad. It's kind of sad almost that they uh, threw them onto board game geek or someone's bought, someone's taking the time Someone to throw it yeah. on there because it's meaningless. Now, what I'm trying to figure out on the Board Game Geek one is if that's per half, because you could save, because then maybe it's accurate, the number that's there. But anyway, so speaking of my kids playing this, they they adored this, like, like seriously. Like, I, I told you they love Quad Heroes. Sorry, Quad Heroes, you got surpassed by <laughs> Scooby-Doo here. I have never heard either of them laugh so much while playing a game at the table with us. Like, they love the story and the characters, but most of all, that whole fact they could use anyone to do anything. Um, every NPC had to be smelled by Scooby. Shaggy attempted to eat or look for food in every corner. Fred figured out how everything worked. Daphne touched and fiddled with everything she could touch. And Velma sat there and investigated every bit of evidence everywhere. There are parts of this game that uh, we, kids aren't in the room just yes, sound I, very different. I, I agree, but we're keeping it G. It's Scooby-Doo. All right, the kids also loved swapping up who was reading. Um, they were, to be honest, arguing over who got to read which book. Um, at first, we considered the whole giving them a book each, but then quickly learned about the thing where not all characters are in the game at all times. So we dropped that. Uh, we did find that each one had their favorite character. Uh, interestingly, Big G took towards Fred and Scooby for Little G. Excellent. Now, what I found most impressive about this game, though, is the level of immersion and exploration compared to like other escape room style games or, or escape room in a box style games or puzzle games. This was just so much more thematic, like it had an overall story and the puzzles were actually linked to the story and made sense with it. It wasn't just, oh, you open the next thing and here's another random puzzle. Like even the keypad puzzles were tied into the theme. They weren't just abstract logic puzzles. Like they're, I, I can't give it away, but like it was all tied into this, this mansion, this haunted mansion. There's also a great sense of exploration that almost made it feel like a sandbox. Like, like there was a, a full sense of wonder with having all kinds of features in the room and a mix of character skills that you could combine with those. It felt like we were wandering around and discovering clues. Yeah, no, it's, it's you know, Scooby-Doo really is something that is for the whole family, right? There's there's something in there for everyone from from veiled references that adults will laugh at mm. to outright comedy that the kids are just gonna love oh, yeah. uh both slaps slapstick and pun based uh, humor mm -hmm. and the fact that they have put so much writing into this and given you all those options you know that ability to put every character with every clue mm -hmm. means that it, it is a sandbox essentially you know it's it's yeah. only limited by the amount of time they were allowed to get to write the new thing yeah basically yeah now, what I realized last night, so we did save overnight and we played the second part today, is I, this clicked in this morning and I totally missed this last night. 
yes, this is basically an escape room in the box, right? It's an exit game. It's an unlock. But what I realized this morning was, you know what it's more like is digital point and click adventures, like, like Myst or, or Seventh Guest or the Telltale series for the modern ones. Telltale Batman or Telltale Firefly or all of those. Because it's all about figuring out the right person to use on the right spot with the right combination of objects. Which is basically what you do in all those point and click adventures. Or if you're an old guy like me, the old text adventures of Zork where yeah. you've got to, you know, and, and, and every object you have, you're going to try with everything. So if exactly. you've got someone who can eat, you are going to try and eat every object it lists in that room's inventory. Mm -hmm. Because you never know whether or not, you know, in you know, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy uh, text adventure, whether or not you're going to need to hold T and no T in your hands at the same time. No, exactly. And that's, that's, that's a feel I totally, like, I missed it when we were playing. I'm like, it really is like that type of game, which is really cool. So that's a ton of good, right? So how about some negative points? Well, uh, the biggest one would be that list when you start chapter three, like, please include all of the items you need to act, or sorry, chapter two that you need to go into chapter two. That would have saved us a lot of time this afternoon. That would have been a nice one. Uh, the second one, and this is going to be a big one for a lot of players, uh, similar to what we were talking about almost with app-based games earlier tonight in today's episode. Um, this is one and done. It's 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 not a very long experience, despite the fact we're saying it's, it's longer than we expected. This is still a single session or two session game. You could finish this entire game in one sitting if you've got a longer game night. There is one story. You're not getting multiple chapters. There's there's no adventure here. This is not a campaign game that you're going to be playing for weeks. This is sit down and play through a Scooby Doo episode. Yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's the the price point is licensed price point. So that's the other thing you're getting into, right? So it's for a one and done game. Even if you are getting a ton of things, you have to weigh how much you really enjoy that license because you are playing mm -hmm. the license markup on what is an exit game in a box and it's a very good one um yeah. but you have to weigh that cost for this particular one done so now on a very positive note about this though compared to the exit games is you don't destroy anything while playing this game so once you're done you could technically play again if you wanted or go back and explore the things you didn't but more likely is you could pass this game on to another group or sell it on the secondary market so that is something that I think needs to be taken into in the cost. Whereas you look at an exit game for 15 bucks, it's done. Like it's garbage. Yeah. There's nothing you can do with it. Whereas this, you might be able to recoup half your cost. Right. Unless you throw out the box and sort of. Well, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I'll just with those boxes. Now, as for other negatives, um, the quality is so-so. Um, I wish things were better quality. Like the books, as I said, are floopy. Like they're thin and flimsy. They flop around. They're like the thinnest possible page count. They are color. Um, the mine are somewhat warped. Um, part of the Scooby-Doo one, actually, some of the ink has worn off on the corners. Mm. The standees really kind of bum me out. Like, like they're almost paper thin. Like, uh, I don't know if you remember years ago playing the paranoia with the miniatures. Like, that's it. Like, these these are a piece of paper folded in half, basically. Like, right. th there's not much to them. Um, the, the, the room cards are the same thing. Like, these aren't board game boards. These are thin card. Um, what's weird is some of the stuff you unlock in the envelope, envelopes, envelopes, is a uh, punch board. Like, like, actual cardboard and comes pre-punched, which is just weird. Like, why are those punch board, but the rest isn't? And I get it, right? Just what we just talked about. This is a one and done. They had to be very aware of what the game would cost when they were making this. And as it is, this game costs literally double an escape game and they, to, to bring out the Cosmo games we've reviewed in the past. This is double the cost. By swapping all the cardstock to cardboard, I have a feeling it would have cost more than double an exit game and probably would have scared people's off for a one and done game. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. And I think... Again, the real power of this is the license, right? And the fact that they have well, they have they have really gone to great lengths to recreate that feel of a Scooby Doo episode. So, for mm -hmm. anyone who's a real fan of the show, I, I that that really makes it hard to pass up something that has recreated that so nicely. Yeah. Now, overall, I'm pretty sure you can tell uh, this was a pretty glowing review pretty much all the way through. I was very impressed by this game, by Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. The theme and setting are cool, and that made the game family-friendly. The fact I could play uh, a horror mystery game uh, with my youngest was great. 
And oh man, playing with the kids was a hoot. Like just the stuff they were coming up with and how funny they thought the stuff was. They just loved it. The coded chronicle system is brilliant. I think this is 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 now the gold standard way to do a puzzle game like this. I do look forward to more games in the series. Um, while you can only play it once, I think it was worth it. I think that cost, I'll admit, I didn't spend the cost. We did have to think the op for this. I would not feel bad having spent what I, the, the MSRP on this game. I also love the fact that I could now pass this game on. Like now that I'm done, I could next time Sean's in town, he can bring it back up to Hamilton and play it with his kids. I, I'd like that I didn't have to destroy anything. If you like escape room in a box style games, these puzzle games, pick this one up. Like, especially if you've got kids, if, if you've got a family who will play this, pick this up. But even as adults, this is a solid game. Now, if you've never tried a puzzle game like this before, I suggest checking this one out. Like uh, that feeling of exploration and the integration of the theme to me puts it above all the other escape room in a box experiences. Now you're going to dedicate more time to it. You're going to dedicate two nights. It's not a throwaway quick experience, but I think it's worth it. And I think this is a good way to check out, to see if you enjoy that style of games by having a story wrapped around it to keep you interested. Well, for a more in-depth look at Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews. And now, Bell, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. This is another case. We got we to gotta remember, though our show's already going on, is to throw in a lobby at the end of the reviews. I think after both, not after each. I just think one at the end, because there's some really good comments in here in the chat about legacy games and be able to pass games on and the integrating um, people talking about like the Lego games being similar. I think that would have been, this would have been a useful lobby check-in point. So I think we might want to toss that in there next time. So as for games we played, so the first one Deanna and I played was a game you're not going to find on Board Game Geek, though I am tempted to go there and add it. And that is the Wellington Brewery Welly Canland Craft Beer Board Game. I guess every year, Wellington Brewery is a cast beer festival at the brewery itself. This is an in-person event. It's, a, I guess, a big deal and it's a huge crowd. But like many other festivals in 2020, had to be canceled this year. So what Wellington did instead was they put this package on their website. And it was an at-home cast beer festival. And this was in the form of the, this, this package that gave you a bunch of their beers some themed coasters stickers um, some tasting glasses and a board game really can land craft beer now deanna surprised me by breaking out this package on saturday night because why well, normally you guys do your your tastings and your charcuteries but uh yeah. it's nice to have a little extra of the festival feel thrown in. yeah exactly i thought it was pretty cool uh the game itself is a huge paper board like almost bigger than my table this thing's insane um i'm gonna guess it's picnic table size that that's a theory I, I could be wrong we got a bunch of unused wellington beer caps which was cool you know what to be honest i don't think i've ever held an unused beer cap like it, <laughs> it had never been folded it was kind of neat uh d6 a stack of trivia cards and a stack of chance cards as you can probably guess this is a dead simple roll and move with spots on the board all centered around beer drinking now, these spots included things like move forward equal to your alcohol level of your beer or move backwards equal to the alcohol level of your beer. Answering brewing trivia to move forward or back, depending if you get the answer wrong or right. Uh, rewarding the player drinking the weakest beer or the player drinking the strongest. Chance cards that generally had you do silly things like Deanna had to call me brewmaster all night or move backwards. Um, and a lot of stuff that'd probably be a lot more fun if we had drank the beers before we started playing. Um, the neatest part about this was that everything was resolved around trying Wellington beers, which makes sense, right? It's supposed to be a beer fest this was designed for. The problem was there were two of us. So things like the active player closes their eyes and everyone at the table pours a sampler and then or someone at the table pours blind beer for the person to taste. And then they have to guess whose beer they got, right? Like, well, there's two of us. He was drinking the IPA. I was drinking the stout, right? It just didn't quite work. Well, in their defense, they were trying to recreate a beer festival, yes. not a date night. Exactly. That was the thing, right? Like, I actually think this would have been a ton of fun 
sitting outside on a patio with this table out in front of with this board with like eight other people around each having a different Wellington beer. Like, I think that would have been awesome. It, it would have been, it would have added to a beer festival night. I think it would have been great as for playing at home. It was not so great. It, <laughs> it was there. We did it. I shared some pictures online. I thought it was amusing. I still think I might add it on board game geek just because it's amusing. me. <laughs> So after giving up on Welly Can Land, we, I'll admit we didn't finish. No one got the end. There were far too many go back to the beginning spots. Um, we moved over to Unlabeled. Uh, this is the blind beer testing game we reviewed last week. I have to admit, for totally self-serving purposes, I wanted to get some more pictures and talk about playing it so I could link back to our review. Hey, we got to generate our content somehow. Exactly. Like we could have just drank the beers, but I'm like, no, no, this will give me more pictures to share on Instagram that I can link people to the review. It's a good review. You should check it out. It's a decent game. So we played a couple uh, rounds now only using tasters at this point, not full beers. Uh, we used all our house rules we talked about last week, which you can now find on the blog. For those of you looking to improve your new copy of Unlabeled, find my house rules at tabletopbellhop.com. Um, I still say if you're going to be tasting beers, like if, if this is something you do, if you are a beer taster and you sit down with friends and you try different beers, just pick up this game, like just turn it into more of a game night. Like it, it just makes it more engaging and interesting than just sitting, sipping beers and making notes on untap.com. Now, the reason we stuck to tasters is that I had big plans for us to sit down and learn CO2 second chance in prep for tonight's episode, where obviously earlier today I reviewed it. Yeah, no, that didn't happen. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah. Now, I will admit, maybe, I, I will admit this, beer might have been the problem. But honestly, Deanna and I had each had two cans. That's it. I And and both the ones I had, I don't know what Deanna had, were under 5% ABV. So, like, I don't think the problem here was a beer problem. Whatever it was, if it was beer or not, we had a real rough time rocking this game. Like, this, this is Vital Lacerda. This is a heavy gamer. This is a big game, right? This is the same person who designed Vinhos. It's got a Eno tool artwork again on the Second Chance version. This is a game where a lot of the mechanics are deeply tied to the theme. A lot of the stuff we talked about when we talked about Vinhos and the 13 things game designers can do to make their games easier to learn, a lot of that's in here. I even went on Board Game Geek because we're like, br br brains are burning here. And it's actually ranked lower in weight than Vinhos. And I had no problem grokking Vinhos. I don't know what it was. Like, like we just had a terrible time trying to figure out what we should be doing. Like, Deanna was even having a hard time how to do the things we should be doing, which just doesn't happen often. Yeah, which any regular listener knows should be a red flag right away. Deanna's the one who wins all the heavy games. Yeah. So for her to struggle like this is concerning, to say the least. It was rough. Like we play, we ended up playing twice. So CO2 Second Chance was redesigned by Vital Lacerda. It's 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 a redesign of the original game, not just a re-release. It's not like it's just a, a blinged out shiny Kickstarter version. Uh this when he redesigned it, he changed it from a competitive game into a cooperative game. That is now the default play. We lost in year two out of five years, like just and lost badly. Like after that, I'm like, man. You know what? I like CO2. I, I had the original game. It was a competitive game. And I don't remember feeling lost playing it. Like I played it with Mike Barker, who had never seen the game before. And I don't remember who else. It was two other players. Might have been Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton. I can't remember who else I played it with, but we, we managed to figure it out and actually enjoyed it enough at the end. And Mike's not a huge heavy gamer. So I'm like, maybe he changed the cooperative too much. So it includes a competitive version. So all right know what it is it's because we played the co-op he doesn't like co-ops let's switch to the competitive version yeah we we lost in year three so it was better but the world still well the human population the world's probably still going but there were no humans left yeah i'm not sure if better is really what i'd call that but i suppose it's all relative yeah so both of these play experiences were just not what i expected like i said i own the original co2 and I only sold my copy because I knew this one was coming. Like I backed the Kickstarter and I'm, I used some of the money I got from the original to, to make back the money I spent on the, the second one. I, I admit I only played the original twice, but like I liked it a lot. Like it, I, that was one of the games I remember telling Deanna because I played it at the local game store when she stayed home with the kids. I'm like, oh, you're going to like this one. This is your kind of game. It's meaty. It's heavy. You're going to love it. And 
and and it is the game that put Vital Lacerda on the map for me. Like I realize other people probably discover him from other games that that's when I started paying attention. I'm like, Ooh, I like the Telecerta games. I didn't know that. And that's what got me to buy Vinos was because I enjoyed CO2 so much. Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't get why this one was so different that it flopped so badly on us. So you, you just played extreme, right? A little accidental inversion of this or backwards that. See, that's what we actually thought. So at the end of the night, we both grabbed our phones and started doing research on board game geek. I actually got to the point where it's so annoying to look at it on my phone. I came upstairs on the computer to look this up. We played everything right. We got every rule right. We did everything by the book. So then I started diving deeper. What changed from CO2 to CO2 second chance? Sure enough, the rules for the CEP market, that is a uh, carbon something points, it's permits, car, car whatever. Carbon it, it's points? part of the cap and trade system. The, the market completely changed. You could now sell and you could build up the market and all this other stuff. Sure enough, the old game gave players more turns. So that's a huge change because I was thinking that. I'm like, it feels like we can't do enough. Well, in the old game, everyone got five actions, not four. Having one more action could have saved us. Like, it very much felt like that. In the end, I actually found a thread with many, many people, mostly Kickstarter backers, complaining the game was just too hard. And that the competitive mode of play is no longer competitive, it's semi-co-op. Because if you don't work together, everyone's going to lose. And it's all about playing cooperatively with someone winning in the end. It's not actually about beating your opponents. And in that thread, Vital Asurda actually joined in to point out, this is all by design. I wanted a harder game. I want it to feel like this. You were trying to save the planet. He made the game winnable 25% of the time. That's for both modes. So even playing competitively, you're only going to win 25% of the time. Like 25 seems low for a competitive game or a cooperative game. and seems insane for a competitive game. Like, like competitive, we want to see who wins. Like there should be a, like we should be able to mitigate that somehow. Now, Vital, seeing all the complaints in this thread, did come up with some rule suggestions. And what's interesting is I have the Kickstarter version. It comes with a little supplementary rule book. And some of those suggestions are in there that came in with mine for how to make the game easier. So I think without going digging, and I haven't read this thread uh, where he spoke up, uh, I suspect, based on the theme of the game and what you've been describing, that this is probably a statement about the environment and global warming and the state of the world and effects on it. Oh yeah. But I, I hesitate to put any words in the designer's mouth. It, it does seem to be rather uh, environmentally activist. No, it is. And, and the game is all about that. And there are sections in each chapter that talks about all the things you're doing in the game and what people are doing in real life to do it and what companies are doing that are evil and bad like like this is the game is an environmental message it really is so i don't think you're putting words in his mouth i think you're just echoing exactly what he's trying to say um so now where are we at right so as you can tell i'm not really ready to review this one like i and i don't feel ready to review this one because obviously i had mixed wrong expectations going into this game i expected an update to a game i loved i expected veen 2016 vintage versus 2010 reserve is what i thought i was getting with this and i did not this is a very different game than what i was expecting i we were supposed to have played a couple more times this weekend um that fell through no gaming related reason um at this point i don't think i've given the game the chance it deserves I, I went in expecting something more than it was. So what I plan to do now is try again, um, knowing what we're getting, like literally knowing that 25% win rate, knowing that the game, despite saying competitive, is really a cooperative game where someone's going to win. It's what we were talking about earlier, actually, with a, with a suggestion for Brian Kurtz there. So what we're going to do is go in knowing what we what what to expect. And if we still don't like it, we'll try those official rule changes from Vital Lacerda and see if that makes it more enjoyable. So what this means is I'm not ready to share my final thoughts. It's going to take a few more plays. Um, if you are a fan of the original, though, and do pick this up, realize what it is, right? This is a brutally hard cooperative game or semi-co-op. It is not competitive in my mind. Right. So he's, he's taken, you know, the state of the world has changed since the first game came out. Mm. Uh, and uh, he clearly sees that things have become more dire 
and has changed the game to represent that. Yep, yeah, fair. So another game we got to the table this past week is Watergate from Capstone Games. Now, I won a copy of this game as part of Cap Camp Capstone, their online gaming convention. Um, I've been hearing fantastic things about this game. Many podcasters have started calling this one the best of 2019. It is doing remarkably well. It's board game geek rating is, I think it's an eight point something. It is, it is look, everything looks shiny on this game. Unfortunately, similar to CO2, I don't know what went wrong. Um, our first play was terrible. I, I played the editor, Deanna played the Nixon administration, and I lost on turn five. Anyone who knows the game knows that Nixon wins if he gets five. Uh, I always forget the name of this. Oh, progression no whatever they're called red markers momentum markers thank you deanna if he gets five momentum markers he wins the fact that i lost on turn five means that every round the nixon administration grabbed a momentum marker and i felt i couldn't do a thing to stop her like that was not fun at all right now could that could could part of your you're not american you never took american history and you probably don't actually know that much about the watergate uh situation uh, could that have affected, like, no. is, does, does knowledge of the of the history change things? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. And to be honest, if it was based on history, it should have been the other way around with uh, Nixon being impeached easily instead of staying in office for five years or whatever, five momentum tokens worth. No, I, I honestly think you don't need to know anything about it because I know nothing about it, but I don't think that had any impact whatsoever on my ability to win. This is actually an abstract game. It's pattern building and it's a tug of war between evidence, initiative, and momentum back and forth um, without getting into the full details of the game because we'll do that some other time. So we played a second game, right? Now I'd seen the game, I'd seen it work, and I know just how important momentum is and how I have to keep that away from the president. Um, and it went better. I, I still got totally destroyed, but at least I wasn't crushed. Like I didn't lose in as quick as you can possibly lose. Um, but it was still the same thing. Like she still managed to win by momentum. It had nothing to do with blocking me. It was just taking the red token every turn. So I was starting to think maybe Nixon's overpowered, which is terrible in a two player game. Like that just shouldn't happen. Right. Like if it's two player, it should be as balanced as possible. Um, I got to say Nixon possibly being super powered might be great in a cooperative game. And maybe Vitalis Lacerda can design it and give us a 25% win rate. But in a two player game, especially one rated in like eights, I, I couldn't believe that it would be that lopsided. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like this is a lightly rated game. That's gotten an eight. No, this has got enough ratings that yeah. it's a solid, it's a solid 8.1 on BGG. I mean, that's the math works out on that one with, with sheer numbers. Yeah. So, so we tried a third game. I'm like, all right, let's swap it. Right. You, you I'll, I'll play next in the administration. Deanna won again. So I don't know this time she was the editor. Maybe it's just me. Um, like when we were talking about CO2, when Deanna was playing CO2, she was like, I feel stupid. That's how I felt playing Watergate. I don't know. I don't know if the game's terrible. Like, like it's not well balanced. There's something wrong with it, or I'm just terrible at it. Like, I have to assume it's an eight on board game geek. I can't be that bad. Like, I don't know. I, I'm not feeling the hype here. I, I don't see what people seem to love so much about this game after these plays. But uh, it's ranked one, uh, 271 overall. And that's it's still new, so it's probably just going to climb. So I don't know. Uh, this is another one. I'm going to have to give this a few more tries before I sh share share my final thoughts but it's not looking so good for watergate for us despite the fact everyone else seems to love it i don't know well i mean you know we all have our tastes right uh, yeah. you're not gonna uh one night werewolf isn't gonna be high on your list either no no social deduction well i guess there's some you got to kind of read players and what cards are gonna play i don't know I, I maybe i should be looking on board game geek and see if there's other people who are like you just have to play enough times to learn the cards or something i don't know Finally, the, the last game that hit our tables this week uh, was Scooby-Doo, Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Played this with all four of us, Deanna, myself, and the kids. Fantastic family experience. I already raved about this one enough in the review statement, but I do want to mention here, um, since we did play it this past week, and I try to cover all the games we played. Now, note, it, it did take us multiple sessions to finish this, and I think you should plan for that. Like, don't assume you're going to get it done in one night. Yes, I guess you can do it, but you're going to need like a four-hour game night to do it. I was thinking probably a three hour game night from both groups, but there is definitely a chance where you have to um, leave room for people to explore, especially when playing with kids. Like um, we probably could have rushed things 
but like and and skip the obviously wrong answers but the kids wanting to eat smell investigate research and use everything on every card meant it took longer than it might have took right well how about a look ahead all right so Due to the issues with CO2 and the fact that I totally forgot this week was an AMA, our whole planning was kind of thrown out the window and everything got a bit out of whack. So I think I got figured out at least what's going to happen next week. So right now I am going to be looking at, we're going to be looking at, Sean and I are going to talk about some of the best modern two-player games. I haven't decided what modern means yet. I don't know if I'm going to cut it off like the best two-player games come out in the last three years or five years. Probably one of those two. Um, and based on a question that someone's looking for, for two player games are in print, right? Like we already talked about two player games, but this is the stuff you could go to your game store and get right now is what we're trying to go for the new hotness. Um, thinking at the time that Watergate would be on that list. So we'll see. Um, with that we do, I do, I want to get those other plays of Watergate in there. I want to see if, uh, if I'm missing something and, uh, if, if, if see where that belongs on the list, if it's going to be on our list or be in the honorable mentions, it's at least going to be in the honorable mentions based on everyone else loving the dang thing. Uh, also, we're going to hope to review the Pathfinder Adventure card game 2019 course set that is going to require Deanna and I sitting down and pounding through a few adventures. I'm hoping to at least finish the, the, the more than half of the intro box set adventure, if not all of it. I'd like to get it all done, of course. Uh, with things going on lately, this is subject to change. We may be doing something completely different, but it's going to be two player games, Watergate and Pathfinder Adventure card game. If things all go as planned. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Sean P. Kelly. Thanks for stopping in during our Gloomhaven stream last week. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Mom. Misdirected Mark. Join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Queen time. Queen Star. 8 p.m. Eastern. Not Queen's time. Uh, I, I forget what Queen's 6 time. 6 p.m. the Queen's 6 time, 6 time, I think. Uh, as they talk games, game mastering at twitch.tv slash misdirected Mark. Evil John ran away just before hearing his name live. Looking forward to checking out Nippon with you on Sunday. Well, that was the double bell. Ah, uh, that means my shift's coming to an end. We're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. I feel like the content we're providing would like to support our continued efforts and our continual improvement. Please consider tipping the bellhop through our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. Hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern, New York, Toronto, every Tuesday morning. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the after show where there's a box to open. Yep. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.